Welcome to the Happy Pair Podcast, where our ultimate goal is to inspire, educate, and awaken your curiosity, and overall, to help you to become healthier and happier. We're Dave and Steve, identical twins who started a veg shop nearly 20 years ago. Since then, it's expanded into a social following of over one and a half million people, nearly 50 million views of our videos, nearly half a million books sold, cafes, farms, apps, courses, food products to help you to eat more veg. We speak to thought leaders, health experts, trailblazers and specialists of all kinds, from the ones you know to those you've never, ever heard of. This week's podcast is sponsored by Vivo Barefoot Shoes. We've been wearing them for six years and genuinely they are our favourite shoes and that is all we wear beyond being barefoot. Yeah, they're really, really great. They've tons of different varieties. Uh, You get 15% off with the code HAPPYPAIR15. And if you don't like them, what do you do, Dave? You can send them back within 100 days and get your full money back. Wow, so you have no risk. No risk. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So if you're interested, vivobarefoot.com and the code is HAPPYPAIR15. Surreal to be with you guys finally after all these years of intending to be here. I'm glad to get yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> glad it happened. Yeah, thanks, Life. Uh, okay, okay. One thing, one thing which we've noticed over having conversations with people over the last number of months, people from various different fields, microbes and microbacterial, and the whole bacterial world seems to be becoming more topical, maybe in the niche that we're in, in the little echo chamber we're in. And I'm just curious as to like, microbes and where you are at because you've you've kind of almost been the tip of the spear and in our experience of being such an evangelist and a spokesperson representing microbial biodiversity mm-hmm. and how microbes can really enhance the human experience and at a planetary level at the current state of where we're at with humanity there's no real question there it's more an opening it's an observation. statement <laughs> an opening statement so there we go gentlemen. great statement thanks and it's almost like you know we're fed this illusion of autonomy and the eye really is predominantly microorganisms than it is human DNA. So it's like, where does the eye versus the microorganism start and finish? Mm, good question. So, I mean, uh, certainly on the macro trend, you're absolutely right. Uh, 10 years ago, there was a niche group of scientists talking about the relationship of the microbiome to diseases of the human but the general public hadn't grabbed that term. And then you fast forward to the last couple of years and you have Dove Soap putting out, you know, a soap that's friendly to the microbiome as their tagline. You know, it's like that's that you've reached the, the public when or you've reached a tipping point in, in the awareness of a concept when it becomes the tagline for for soap, which obviously is that's not how soap works, not not friendly to the microbiome. But <laughs> But they felt the need to address that as a soap company. So, you know, looking to be bad for the microbiome has gotten to that point where soap companies are trying to reposition themselves away from killing bacteria, which, of course, soaps have been in the marketplace to kill bacteria since the origin of soap. And so it's this pivot of of love towards or concern for the microbiome has really come front and center. So. The second statement there is kind of around the fascinating science that continues to get more and more indicative of this fact. There's actually one organism on Earth, and it is Earth. This is one living organism. And there's many species that have sprung out of that organism's genomic possibility, which is a library of genetic information that is held in the air, in the soil, in the waters, in the oceans. And these are commonly referred to as viruses, but this is a a data bank of genetic possibility. And in the air we breathe, there's some 10 to the 31 different viruses, one with 31 zeros after it. So you're at more genetic opportunities in the air that we're breathing than our stars in the universe kind of thing. And then 10 to the 31 other viruses in the ocean water, 10 to the 30 in the soil beneath our feet. So these are such astronomical data points or, or astronomical you know, repositories of genetic information that sit in and among our experience as an earthworm or as a dog or as a human. And so we are really living, breathing genetic progression. In the recent pandemic, the term you know, you know, gain of function got used as like a scary term that there was these gain of function labs. And what what does that used. mean? I don't there's, it's the narrative where you have um, scientists who are trying to figure out new gene sequences to put into different materials, whether it be your genetically modified food or genetically modified animals that we're doing now. We're doing genetically modified salmon in the United States uh, now in distribution. Genetically modified mosquitoes just got put into California. 
So we're genetically modifying things to try to give them a gain of function that would be an advantage. advantage. Almost like an evolutionary advantage. Yeah, it's trying to accelerate an evolutionary concept. So at any rate, but you could also do this in a negative way. And so the concern was that, the, that there was laboratories doing gain of function for respiratory viruses to make them more aggressive, to make them more dangerous to, to humans. And so the concept of a virus being a gain of function as a new technology that humans are doing is not accurate. This is the gain of function game that's been playing on this planet for 4 billion years as viruses have been made available to life. And life is using these viruses to make more and more extraordinary advances in biodiversity and ultimately intelligence. So virus, from that perspective, like viruses are as I've heard you articulate it, because I certainly am not a scientist, it's almost like an update. Like it's the same way your phone updates or software updates regularly and it goes, oh, and it's 2.1 and oh, cool, I've got it fixed a few bugs and maybe there's a little less trauma in this one or there's better digestion in this update. And that's the kind of whole idea with viruses that viruses, you know, most people's perception of viruses is a, a negative context. Oh, there's a virus going around, like, oh, be careful. You want to, don't want to, you want to be going to bed early or whatever. But viruses, ultimately, it's a capacity to transform us and give us an update. 100% that. Viruses are never against the organism. And the organisms have been designed to make sure that's true. The most regulated step in biology is the decision to take a new genetic sequence and turn it into a protein. Genes are transcribed into proteins by lining amino acids up along the nucleic acid template of the gene. And so you basically have a blueprint that's, you know, stored in the nucleus or in the case of a virus can be brought in from outside. And this new blueprint for a protein is brought in. The decision to turn that into a protein such that it would start to quote unquote replicate, which is the scary picture we're given is like viruses come in and take over your cells and reproduce themselves. Viruses are not living beings. They can't take anything over. They don't have any intelligence to them. They don't ha they're simply a genetic packet of information. Your cell has to decide whether it's going to challenge itself with this new opportunity or not. It's like going to the gym. You know, you're like, am I going to do that new exercise? So I went and did a hit exercise with you guys today. And so a bunch of six or seven guys in a ridiculously small space trying to do seven different exercises in one minute intervals and I'm wearing boxing gloves for the first time in 30 years and hitting a bag. And, and I'm th sitting there watching this go down. And like, am I going to punch that bag? Because I, my shoulders may be stiffer than usual tomorrow because that bag's swinging back at me. And, well, that's a decision that I'm making at that point. And I know that if I go and hit that bag, I'm going to have a repercussion in my body. It's going to ultimately make me stronger. But I have to be willing to do the work of trans, you know, of the adversity. damage and the re response to damage, you know, the challenge and the response to challenge to get stronger. A virus is very much that. It is a new exercise or a new opportunity for your, your system to get stronger. And so your system is constantly deciding. In my bloodstream right now, I've got 100 billion different viruses coursing through my bloodstream right now. 10 to the 15. 100 billion. 100 billion different viruses coursing through my bloodstream right now. And I have 70 trillion cells that are trying, each having to decide, do I need this new genetic sequence or not? If it decides it's going to make that, it has to do one of the most beautifully complex ballets ever seen to go ahead and start to transcribe that into a protein. There's 200 different little tiny peptides and proteins that have to bind or release from that DNA sequence and from all of my enzymes that would go and translate that. And so it's literally 200 checks and balances to make sure you want to make this new protein. So if somebody, quote unquote, gives you a virus, you know, or my kid came home sick and then I got sick. Well, that's not an infection from the kid. That was a new virus that the kid took up to challenge its immune system. The kid decided, OK, I'm ready to exercise. And its immune system is doing a dance with it. And the whole body is taking up this virus to do a new something or other. To get stronger. To get stronger somewhere in the mix. And the strength comes on a lot of levels. One, you have a new genetic sequence that you can store and, and, and use for later use for God knows what. We're not intelligent enough in genetics or proteomics yet to be able to predict what these new viruses can do for us. But there are superpowers somewhere hiding in that mix. And as those viruses are coming through, there's also the blessing of the immune reaction itself. And so the immune system is surveilling protein synthesis in every single cell. 
And if one protein starts to get overproduced, the immune system goes and eliminates a few cells that are overproducing those proteins. Could be an endogenous protein, could be something from outside like a virus. So the immune system is always checking that. So if an external new genetic sequence comes into my body and I start getting sick, quote unquote, and I suddenly feel really exhausted. Why do I feel exhausted? Because my body's putting so much energy into this new update. This is the same thing on your phone. Suddenly, oh, great, I can't use my phone because it's updating. For an hour or whatever. So your phone or your computer sitting there sequencing is doing a lot of work to eliminate old files, bring in new files, make sure the new files are running correctly. It's doing a ton of work, and so you, it can't bother with your your Instagram feed right now. Like, it's too busy doing that. That's what's happening when you get a virus. You've got so much upgrade going and your body is doing so many new files, access memory, old files are being rejected and dumped. So you've got this huge, beautiful dance going and that's taking all of your energy. So you lay down and you're like, go to sleep, man, I feel terrible. The opposite is actually true is my God, I'm, this is incredible. I'm turning into a bionic person right now. I don't even know who I'm about to become. I'm fascinated. So we should so reprogram virus, ourselves. Viruses need to rebrand. Sickness needs a rebrand. Sickness needs a rebrand. Sickness is so, so your almost, reboot. So sickness is almost like a, that's a total paradigm shift for modern Western life by at large. You know, and it kind of comes back almost to that kind of slightly Eastern idea that like illness comes out of an imbalance or an, an energetic imbalance or the, the, and there's information to kind of tell yourself where you've been in balance. I know myself when I'm slightly out of imbalance, my glands will always come swollen and that's always the first indicator get some rest, take it easy. And you're, you're taking life too serious, chill out, you know, and that, that type of concept, whereas the way you're talking about it is a lot more holistic, a lot more looking at the bigger picture of what actual illness is doing to the system. Yeah. Uh, and from my standpoint, I, I can get the same thing where I'm pushing a little too hard, don't sleep for a little bit, start to get those little red flags, like things are going too much. And if I pay attention to that and, and come into alignment with my purpose, with my soul energy, whatever it is I'm really here to do, I don't need to go get fully sick. If I ignore those and keep pushing, then I get sick. But is the sickness really there to hurt me or is the sickness there so I can actually push harder again later? You know, and I'm not sure which is there, but I know it's there to make me pause. And the pause, when you reframe it of like, uh, instead of being all pissy about your sickness, instead get super curious at your heart center, in your belly, that sixth sense that you have, start to ask, is this really a problem or is this me doing something really interesting? Am I going to go make another body after this? Is my immune system going to be smarter than it's ever been? And so leaning into those moments of sickness are a really powerful way to reframe it. And you heal much faster when your emotions are not, you know, oh shit, I'm weak, or I'm just dysfunctioning. Or, and instead you're like, wait a second, this is my body paying attention to the amount of energy I'm putting out and I'm slowing down in this moment, maybe to redirect or to get stronger to do the thing I was doing before. And then you can go into a state of gratitude and wonderment. I've got 70 trillion cells that are updating right now. And I'm going to go into this process. And when you're in a fever, it's very exciting because fever is your best anti-cancer compound in your, your approach. It's a huge technology that was developed for really improving survival. And so you guys put me through quite an adventure this morning. We were in eight degrees Celsius water, and then we were in sauna at 70 degrees Celsius just seconds later. What you're putting your body through at that point is is really a challenge to cells to to respond to uh, to the environment. So similar stress. to the exercise stress, you know, so you're stressing your body to force it to respond. And so the cold, my body has to function core temperature 37.5 degrees Celsius all the time. And if it starts to drop because I'm in eight degrees Celsius water, mitochondria immediately, which are the little microbes that live inside of ourselves. And these guys take glucose and fatty acids into energy. And typically that energy is in the form of electricity or light energy, electromagnetic field, and something called ATP that's kind of at the end of that process. So you typically you're basically you can picture it like a power station just pouring light energy or electricity out into the grid so everything can run. Uh, everything can plug in and run. Your enzymes are running off that energy, your detox pathways, your 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 metabolic function towards anabolic building of muscle, whatever it might be. 
all of that's running. And then suddenly I'm in eight degree weather and, and or eight degree water and my core body temperature is dropping really quickly. All the mitochondria do this really cool thing where they uncouple the main enzyme that produces ATP and instead starts making heat. And so it uncouples immediately. And, and now I'm not making electricity, I'm making heat. And if it can't keep up, the mitochondria start to divide. And so you start to, to get division of the bacterium inside your cells. A typical human cell when you're two years old, we were been around a lot of delightful little kids the last couple of days in your family. Those little kids are running on high octane. That, they have so much energy flowing through because they have so many mitochondria packed in every cell. And as you get older, you have less. As you get older, you lose about one and one two percent of your mitochondria every year from age two forward. And the more toxin you're exposed to, the faster you lose mitochondria. And so you and mitochondria are essentially your power plants. They're your human energy source to some degree. Yeah, and they're not human. Is an interesting thing to keep in mind. So they're, they're bacteria. They're living they're in every inside cell in your, your human cell. And yet, science always had it that mitochondria were like the center of your cell, the human cell. Yeah, the human. They they call it a human organelle. You know, make it sound like it's part of the the human thing. But they're bacteria, and they have their own genome. Their genome is very simple. There's only like, depends on the species of mitochondria because there's quite a few species. So it's kind of an infinite number really because mitochondria are very fast at adaptation and at their genetic level. So they're very quick to, to sequence out different variations or species within your body. But typically around 30 genes or something like that, it can be as few as 13 genes in a mitochondria in, and it's held in a viral capsid. So it's a, a, a circular DNA strand instead of the double helix of the famous double helix human DNA. But as you mentioned, the lines are blurring between bacteria and human. What, where's the genes? Who's who? What am I really? If I'm human or am I, is me human being different than bacteria? And this is getting very strange right now as we're starting to realize that mitochondria, because they're so prone to misspelling their own genetics, they don't do a lot of proofreading of their own genome because it's a very simple genome. And the most important genes that they would have are for like mitochondrial reproduction and things that shouldn't change. So they've learned to store their important genes in the human nucleus, integrated into your double-stranded DNA and then they go and access your human DNA to, to do their replication or whatnot. So they have found a much safer place to store their DNA in the human nucleus. And they can go and swap back and forth. <laughs> and now we're finding out that you can't actually uh, copy or clone an animal, human or otherwise, unless you clone the, the ge genome of the, all the mitochondria also. So like Dolly the sheep, that first mammal yeah, that yeah. was cloned, it looked like a copy to us because you look at a fuzzy four-legged thing and yeah, it looks the same, you know, but really that sheep didn't look like the, do the first, Dolly two didn't look like Dolly one. Different eye colors, different, you know, snout length. So it was not a perfect copy at all, except that the sheep genes were identical. And this nagged the science community for quite a while of, I mean, you can literally sequence both and they're identical. Why is it not in the right shape? And so the theory was, well, maybe it's epigenetic, you know, which means that the environment is coding the genes differently because it's a different time place that sheep was born. And that's definitely true. But more recently, we're realizing it's because we didn't clone the mitochondria that were in Dolly 1. And we ended up with much different mitochondria in Dolly 2. And the mitochondria are ultimately determining what shape that being becomes as well. And so this wow. concept of epigenetics is moving from... And mitochondria uh, essentially are the bacteria which are... Living inside of you. Are ultimately determining... So, yeah, so, so this dance where we now know that the human gut microbiome, which is like the soil outside of your body, it's feeding your body. And the nutrients or the lack of nutrients there shapes your genetics through epigenetics, which is basically a method of... of Putting a, putting a super program on the original template, right? And so you've got this blueprint from mom and dad. You two are a good example of an original blueprint that got copied twice, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so you guys have the same template from mom and dad. But it doesn't actually take too long hanging out with you guys to realize there's actually slight differences between you guys. And I won't go into all the details for the ladies as to what those differences might be, but, <laughs> but you got this situation where there really are striking differences in your facial structure, in your body types, 
for the most part, somebody glances at y'all and you won't be able to tell. And you come in and you tell me, I'm Steven, I believe you. Tell me you're Dave, I believe you. But the reality is there's these subtle differences between you, which are undoubtedly the result of the, the change in soil between you and you. The soil system within your cells are slightly different than the soil and in the your And the soil cells. system being a microbiome and gut. Microbiome in your gut, but also this microbiome inside your cells, which is the mitochondria. And so your mitochondria have a different genetic sequence than yours do just due to exposure, uh, to, exposure different to different experiences. And, and so the mitochondria are adapting differently in your body than to your body. So not only is the microbiome of the gut, there's a microbiome of every cell. Every and cell. And that exists in the mitochondria. It's taken, like, like the last five years, we've got our head around the microbiome and, oh, the microbiome, and this is how you do to look after it. And, you know, you eat lots of plant-based foods and fiber and you exercise and you sleep and all these basic, you know, health things encourage the health of the microbiome but now there's another biome which is in each cell in your body which one influences the other and i'm sure they're all codependent and interrelated in every sense interrelated yeah i think that's what we're going to find out in the, over these next you know five ten years is that there's constant swapping of genetic information between the bacteria of your gut the immune system that lies just you know a, a fraction of a millimeter away from that gut microbiome 80 percent of your immune system lies in your gut lining it's something called the gastrointestinal associated lymphatic tissue or the galt is the the acronym g-a-l-t and the galt is where you hold about 80 percent of your immune system and it it is massive in volume because the the surface of your gut covers two tennis courts it's a huge surface area and then so if you imagine two tennis courts of little cells that are about half the width of a human hair, you got billions and billions of cells to make up those two tennis courts. And that's just the surface of your gut, one cell layer deep. And then just deep to that, you've got layers of 60 to 100 la layers of cells that are T cells, B cells, your immune system at large. And so you have this extraordinary cellular data bank of information and we used to think the immune system was there to sterilize your body but as this discussion is demonstrating actually the body is an entire ecosystem every single organ actually is now understood to have bacteria and fungi outside the cells and then of course you have the mitochondria inside the cells so you really are a walking organic garden you have microbes everywhere inside outside the cells every single organ with its unique soil system and so the immune system was never there to sterilize us and this whole belief that we need to sterilize the human experience has limited our our efficacy as doctors and we're now seeing this in spades in hospital systems worldwide the your chance of dying in a hospital from a secondary infection now is one of your highest risks of you know death you know it's worse than a cancer diagnosis because you get one of these secondary infections and can kill you in days and so these secondary infections are super bugs that were created by too many antimicrobials, which were creating too much monoculture. Too sterility and too much antibiotic, that type too of... Much, yeah, too much effort towards sterility. Mm. And so when you try to sterilize an environment, only a few species survive, and they then form a relative monoculture. And at the same time we're doing that in the ICU setting, we're planting corn, soybean, and wheat across the entire bowl arable farmable land of the world so we create monoculture in the macro and my my yeah the micro it seems like the micro and the macro like you know like humans where does the human end and where does the greater biome the greater earth you know end because ultimately we all think we're autonomous individuals going along living our own lives from the programming that we've got from you know all the genetic and microbial and you know cultural and social and all these various things and i'm just wondering where like it seems that we're both intrinsically linked like as individuals to the greater current environment because if you look at nature itself biodiversity has decreased massively over the last 50 years 100 years certainly the last 50 years anyway you know we're almost you know that the natural systems are kind of breaking down and if you look at the human health in one aspect we've got better at extending it you know mm -hmm. via you know uh, medical interventions and you know we've got better at expanding this but ill health is certainly expanding as well and gut related and microbial related and it seems like they're both to some kind of you know dance or mirroring that happens between the, our internal gut and the exterior gut or biome or i don't know what the word is 100 percent true yeah as as we start to inflict our environment with more and more herbicides which are ultimately antibiotics right and, and so the the primary herbicide globally is glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in the famous weed killer Roundup in the United States. 
Uh, we now pour 4 billion pounds of that single chemical into our soil and water systems globally. And it's a water soluble toxin, which means that it's going to be carried in the rainwater runoff from our farms into our rivers. From there, we get a lot of evaporation into the air we breathe. It goes out into the ocean, more evaporation ends up in the clouds that rain on us. In the United States, about 85% of our rain is contaminated with Roundup, and about 85% of the air we breathe is detectable for Roundup. So we're really steeped in this antibiotic. And so it's not surprising that we're becoming antibiotic resistance in one sense. Yeah, and it doesn't. it's not surprising in the end as you start to understand health as a result of biodiversity. As we kill the biodiversity, we become more and more vulnerable to collapse. And looking back over time, you can see what what the direct results of, of human health was. If we, we started spraying this chemical into our soil systems in 1976 in, in large scale. It was patented in 1974, Monsanto. Uh, and as it went really gangbusters in, in, the, in the 80s as like the best weed killer that had been on the market, we started having homeowners using this, not just our farmers. And homeowners were spraying it on dandelions in their in their driveway or whatnot. And homeowners were using a lot higher concentration of this than farmers that were, you know, spot spraying or whatnot. Farmers, it's their bottom line, depends on, you know, trying to treat a couple thousand acres. You gotta be pretty sparing with it. Mm. But as a homeowner, it's not hard to buy, you know, a gallon of Roundup for 30 bucks and then go drench a few weeds in the thing. And then it rains and then all that washes down into your gutter, which ends up in your municipal water system. So we started drinking. And it can't be filtered out from the water system. Like it's not filtered out through any of our typical systems. So we started drinking glyphosate in the early 80s. And in that space, we, we see the advent of the obesity epidemic start to hit in the U.S. first. And then as those farming practices and, and cultural practices of easy, far, easy gardening with weed killers... Uh, started to spread, it, it followed. And so each country that has adopted herbicide and pesticide management from a Western you know, influence has seen the obesity epidemic hit. And every culture has seen this now. But in the U.S., the numbers are pretty grotesque. We're now at 71% of our population, adult population, is either overweight or obese. Uh, some 43%, I think we're at now, are uh, clinically obese. And um, I think it's somewhere around 30% are are considered morbidly obese, which means that they've got very high risk of secondary diseases like heart disease, cancer, and other things from their obesity being the risk factor. So we are really pushing the envelope of survivability as a species now four decades into this journey. So obesity is the first sign of collapse of the mitochondrial metabolism ultimately. What obesity is, is the storage of calories that can't be burned. You guys are burning calories so fast and furious. I've been around you for a day here, and it's it's constant movement, constant new activity, constantly new challenge to the body. We're in perpetual motion with you guys. And so this is a situation where our mitochondria are under such heavy demand, and, and you guys are eating some of the cleanest food on earth. You guys just took me around your whole facility here that's making some of the most extraordinary food on the planet from the most clean ingredients you guys can find. So you're eating clean calories that are as low as possible in glyphosate, probably not zero because again, it's raining on it, it's it's everywhere. It's almost impossible to get to to zero. But with these, these clean foods you guys are consuming, that quickly turns into the energy that you guys are able to express into the world. For the rest of the population that's consuming a lot of glyphosate, they're killing their the bacteria inside of their cells the quickest. So the mitochondria are super sensitive to antimicrobial uh, kind of insult or injury. And so the mitochondria suddenly you know die back because of an exposure to Roundup or from an antibiotic from their doctor even. And that antibiotic killing those mitochondria then leaves us deficient in the ability to turn your calories into the light energy that the the body runs on. And so you're either doing electricity or you're doing heat at the mitochondria level, as we talked oh, yeah. about. And if you can't get the ca- calories in there because there's a, a deficiency in, in vitality of your mitochondria, then they get backed up at the port. The macro version of this just happened in the United States and, and many other countries around the world where we no longer produce most of the food that we consume as Americans. We've outsourced that to cheaper labor and everything else around the world. So we have 3,000, 5,000 mile supply chains that have to come in via the ports. And then COVID hits and we lose the workforce for the ports. We lose the workforce for the truck drivers. And we lose the, all of a sudden grocery store shelves in the United States were empty for the first time in 
my lifetime and really almost in a hundred years. And so those empty grocery store shelves are the macro version of what's happening inside of somebody who's obese, their cells, not getting the, the groceries on the shelf. They can't access the nutrients they need that day. Instead, all the calories are backed up at the ports. And so we had ships that were where, lined up all port? over the place. Where's the port in the body? Like so the liver. Oh, the liver. Okay. So the first place that gets backed up with calories is the liver. And as you start storing calories in the form of fat, which is your best storage device for calories. So excess calories goes into fat because fat storage is very low maintenance. It's like, you know, finding a storage unit for all the extra stuff that you can't fit in your house. And it's like, well, that one's $39 a month. And that, that one over there is $19 a month. The fat storage is the cheap storage unit. And so, you know, so that your body's going to so quickly put all the crap put you don't want to deal with in there. Yeah. All the stuff that, you know, your grandma gave you, you don't know where it fit in the house or whatever it is. So you you pack that in there. And so you're packing calories in the form of fat into the liver. Unfortunately, fat cells stored in the liver, though, at some point do have a burden of energy. And this is an inflammatory injury, ultimately, that starts to, to be produced. And so the liver starts to get inflamed. When the liver gets inflamed and then also gets too full, the, that, that stockpile of storage is too full. It has to start storing it in the visceral cavity. So this is the classic beer belly kind of effect. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so you got the gut there. And that's just more backed up calories at the port because it can't get to the mitochondria to be burned. Wow. And so ironically, you know, somebody comes in and they're obese and your first sense is like, ah, that person's just eating too much food. But most of your obese people are eating far less calories than the two of you. The three of us just pounded probably 3,000 calories of hummus and olive spread just and all this wonderful snack. thing just as a snack. And then we're going to go eat our third meal of the day in a few minutes and and so we are pounding calories all the time. And somebody who's obese is not experiencing that, that flow of energy. They're not in flow state with the energetic quality of the body. And they're starting to get this backed up congested state. And so food actually is not as pleasant to the body in many ways. And the only way to get somebody who's in an obese state to, to eat more is to give them a drug, which needs to be some sort of fat, salt, sugar combination that fools the, the brain into eating again. But their, but their innate state, when not given a drug, a food-like drug, their innate state is like, food is overwhelming to me. It's, it's my biggest problem is I've got all of this storage. And so as doctors, we say, ah, oh, you should just eat less. You should do less yeah, or yeah. all this. Move it's, more, eat less, yeah. sleep more. When in fact, they're starving at the cell level because they can't get the calories there. And how do they get it from the, there? How do they get it from the port to the to the cells? So how do you get it back going again? Yeah. And the answer is to start to support the microbiome, i.e., uh, the mitochondria. And how do you do that? You got to do that by decreasing the toxins. And so this is where you know your detox diets come in and everything else is for a period more of time. Food and drinking. Yeah, or, just as or juicing or something where you get high nutrients right. without the calories, you know, and so getting a really high nutrient load from things like celery juice and some of the things that we put people on for a cleanse. They get a lot of a lot of nutrients, micronutrients. So they're getting manganese and selenium and all these beautiful micronutrients without a lot of calories. Celery has almost no calories in there, and so you juice that and take the fiber out, and so you're getting all of this mm. very fast nutrient delivery. Nutrient delivery is starting to ping off the microbiome at the gut level, at the internal level, and at the intracellular level of the mitochondria to make nutrients available. So everything from amino acids to these micronutrients that allow enzymes to work better and all of this starts churning away. So give the person a lot of nutrients with very little calories to get the system starting to, to unplug. And then you can start getting their calorie load moving again. Wow. And so it's, it's like telling somebody who's obese to go exercise doesn't work again because their cells are starving. And so you really, it's about encouraging those mitochondria to get healthy again. So take them off processed and chemical foods and then start to get their, the, the flow of nutrients past the calories. So even though you can't get calories through the system, you can get nutrients through the system. Jeez, and so what? start dumping nutrients in there. And this is why your plant-based diet that you guys have put so many people on is so effective. So you guys have seen this, you guys, when you mentioned the Dean Ornish book comes out and you guys go do this in Ireland and you test people's blood sugar and cholesterol and put them on a plant-based diet for six weeks and suddenly their blood sugars are coming down, starting to lose weight. It's not because they're eating less calories, it's because they're eating more nutrients and they're starting to get the flow going past the past this backlog of calories that are sitting in their liver and gut and they start really nutrifying the system. 
Jeez. It's a lot like growing soil before you grow the plants, right? So you start your composting, all this, you get all the nutrients in there, and then you can plant a seed and, the, and then the seed Just can explode. grow. And so when you switch to a plant-based diet or you do a juice cleanse, this is really about building new soil for your body to spring new life from. And that can take some time, somewhere in that four weeks to three months kind of Building time soil frame. is a great way, a, a great analogy. Yeah, to, yeah, it really is. Because when I think of soil, like people think of, oh, it's just muck and whatever. And But like as as uh, I see it, like we've got a, a, a small farm. Are you going to say you're a farmer? No, I'm not going to say I'm a farmer. I'm involved. But I am a farmer. I'm, I'm a ke- very keen farmer. And uh, on the farm, we we have, there's, there's beds. Say that, that we, again, Dave. You're a... I love vegetables. <laughs> I love <laughs> <on the farm. laughs> anyway, <laughs> vegetable beds went through the season. You leave them fallow for a couple of months because there's nothing going to grow. So we planted a cover crop. And the whole idea of planting the cover crop, a cocktail of different seeds that are nitrogen fixing and all sorts of different ones to bring different microbes forward. So they bring different microbes forward. So then when you plant the vegetables in there, there's all this different microbial diversity which they can absorb so the plant will grow better. And it's the same, I guess, with the human uh, microbiome. And even how that happens is that the crops grow, we cut them, we leave them them fallow on top of it we put some a little bit of plastic sheeting over it so it encourages more fermentation and breaking down and that's like green manure that decomposes into the soil so not only are you getting like nitrogen coming in from the air into the soil you're also getting it from the top level more bacteria and i think that's in essence that's the analogy of the soil and the gut that it's like when you eat when you nutrify or you eat nutrient dense foods you can actually get them into the cellular level and similarly that's what's happening with soil with the idea of cover crops yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You're juicing them. You're basically giving them a juice fast in some ways because you're taking sunlight away, and you're giving them a ton of nutrients. Sunlight is the source of calories, basically, right? So glucose and fatty acids—that's the result of sunlight touching chlorophyll, which are the cousins to mitochondria. These are other bacteria that live inside of the plant cell that takes CO2 and then builds it into long carbon chains, which is glucose or fatty acids. And those long carbon chains are storing sunlight in double carbon bonds two electrons b- between the carbons is the best battery that's ever been invented and so when you're eating you're literally eating sunshine. nature's battery of sunshine and so the glucose from either meat dairy veggies whatever the heck you're eating you're going to get a variety of glucose and fatty acids in that if you're eating protein that's actually not a fuel can't be turned into energy and so if you eat a lot of protein you only need about eight grams of protein a day for amino acids and that stuff. And eight grams is like nothing. Like we ate that on, in one little scoop of hummus there, you know? So some 95% of the, the protein that's consumed by a typical Westerner eating a you know, typical diet has to be converted to glucose by the liver. So that's pretty energetically demanding where the liver has to take all the protein and convert it to glu- glucose, then send it out to the bloodstream to get to the mitochondria so they can burn that as energy. So protein's a very bizarrely inefficient, you know, process, to, process of trying to get energy into the cell. And so low protein, high, high carb and high fat diet is a really efficient way to get nutrients to the cells as far as a, an energy source. And so what's happened now is you're taking all of that, you know, storage of, of sunlight and delivering that to the mitochondria and they're breaking the double carbon bonds back into CO2. And in, in the process, they re- release all that electrical energy that was brought by the sunlight. And so it's similar to a solar panel. A solar panel gets hit by the sunshine, suddenly you're running your toaster off of it. That's sunlight being converted to electricity. And that's all your mitochondria and chlorophyll are doing all day. Chlorophyll are your solar panel. You eat the, eat the lettuce. Now you're converting that to electricity at the, at the mitochondrial level. And so the process that we're all in right now as a planetary species is, or really planetary biology as a whole, is we're seeing the drop in our ability to access sunlight as an energy source. But I think it's to counteract, so say for example, antibiotics, glyphosate in the air, there's all these negative things. What are things that we can do to greatly enhance our microbiome? Because obviously it seems like you know, there's such a symbiotic relationship between the microorganisms, the microbiome and us as humans and the human expression and our energy and our feelings and everything. And what are basic things that we can do, like practical things that people can do? Touch nature is the f- easiest thing. Uh, the American Gut Project is kind of misnamed now because most of the work's being done in Africa now. But Jeff Leach started this in 2001 and um, by 2006 was one of the very first people to be really deep 
decoding or li- putting together a library of the the genome of the human gut started in the U.S., but then was looking at the Hadza tribe over in the Kenya area and, and uh, parts of Africa, and the Hadza people were are still hunter gatherers, and so he was studying like what's the ideal original gut microbiome versus the American gut. They were exposed to about 800 different food groups in their menu, I remember. Yes, yeah, the Hatsa have this huge variety of food. But interestingly to me is they don't eat them like all at once. Like they can be very monotonous in what they get in a week. They find a giant honeycomb and they'll just eat honey for a week. That'll be their, their, you know, 90% of their caloric intake for a week. And interestingly, they've shown that there's (laughs) absolutely no change in the microbiome in their gut over that week of eating honey which is contrary to what we think of like the diet must be the primary driver of your microbiome. What they're showing is that the, the, the Hadza tribe have somewhere around 40,000 mappable bacterial genomes and so species, 40,000 species, whereas the American gut, you're at 10,000 species. So we've lost 75% of our microbiome just as a general gut population work, working and being in a, a, an industrial you know, se- separation from nature kind of environment. And that's certainly in part due to food, but the large piece of this is we're not touching nature, meaning we're living in air-conditioned houses. We go, go into the garage and get into a plastic off-gassing car, and then we drive to the office and we get into an office building that's got completely sealed windows and is heated and air-conditioned chronically every season. It's always 72 degrees no matter what's going on outside. And so this creates a very monotonous experience at the microbiome and other levels. So it doesn't stress that, as you were saying, stress is so important for... Yeah, it's but not even a, monoculture. It's not, like that's fascinating. Even think of our environment as a monoculture. You're in an environment where it's always 72 well, it's degrees. it's the same. If you look at culture nowadays, if I go down the, the high street in Barcelona, the high street in London, the high street in Milan, the high street in New York, I'm going to see a lot of the same shop, shops mm-hmm. like monoculture in the macro as but well as But it's also a modern environment, well as, isn't it? Yeah. It's a similar temperature. You go into most of these lovely modern homes and, you know, they're, they're really warm. They're warm and they're, they're comfortable. And then you go to your office and it's lovely and warm. And in between, you were sitting in your car and it was set at a lovely and warm temperature. Yeah, you got your heat seat around. And oh, it's lovely. <laughs> yeah, they're nice. Yeah, they're <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Okay, so, so touch nature is good. Touch Touching nature. nature and spend this time is, in nature, connecting. And the Hatsa tribe showed us something interesting. This, so this isn't just like, go, go, just go for a walk. It's actually touch the nature with your hands and your body. One of the dominant species in the gut microflora of the Hatsa tribe, they couldn't figure out where it was coming from because they'd never seen it in another gut analysis in the West. And it turns out this bacteria is found in great number on the hides of zebra. Oh, and right. the Hatsa will occasionally go out, hunt a, a hunt zebra. And this is typically a day or two's walk from the, the tribe's camp. And, you know, they, they kill the, the zebra and they quarter the zebra and will carry that zebra on their shoulder for a day and a half back to their thing. By the time they've gotten home, their whole skin is covered in zebra flora. And the kids and the Hots tribe, very, you know, obviously not wearing any clothes, you know, maybe a loincloth or whatever, but they're coming in into this situation where the, the kids are piled on them and there's this great, you know, affectionate reunion happening. And now the whole transfer. tribe, the whole tribe is covered in zebra. And so it's a beautiful look at what we used to do was always be in touch with our food intimately. We were intimately involved in the killing, the processing, the storage transportation of food, whether it be the zebra or, you know, the honeycomb that we found in our walkabout, whatever it is, we were bringing this stuff onto our body and transporting it. Now you go to a grocery store and you've got hermetically sealed everything, plastic sealed. You get a piece of meat in a grocery store. You're certainly not even sure what animal that comes from anymore because it's like red dyed protein from something, right? And so in that experience, you've certainly never, you know, been near the field that animal grazed and you've certainly never touched the hide of that animal. That's assuming it grazed in a field. Yeah, best case scenario, right? Yeah. And so you've got a situation where the food has become so divorced from the human experience or the human experience divorced from the food. And like you said, the food itself has become divorced from its nature. And so we're so many times removed from nature that it's no wonder we're failing in our health. And so the exciting thing to me is if you've got obesity, you've got cancer, you've got whatever your condition, autoimmune disease, it's, it's really about changing your daily routine to, to discover a new connection with nature. 
And so one of my most interesting things for me is ferns. Ferns have been around since before the last extinction. So you're looking at hundreds of millions of years of these ferns. You got one there on the shelf. A fern is such an interesting biome carrier. It, it has all these little bumps along the bottom sides of its leaves that aren't evident when you just look at the fern from the top. But if you run, run your fingers below that, those little bumps have all, it's kind of like the gut lining where it's got little micro ecosystems all up and down that fern leaf. So you're going to get the release of different fungal spores, bacteria, et cetera. And so one of the things I have my patients do that are, you know, acutely or, or life threatening illness going on in their life is to get into a forest where you've got dense forms, uh, dense ferns and run your hands beneath those ferns as you walk through them and breathe deeply and really touch this. This is you getting back intimately involved with nature again. And that intimacy is an immediate return to life. And your immune system learns so much so quickly when it, it gets this you know, new nutrient source. And you guys have seen this. I this always is, think you when I walk through forests and there's ferns and I just rub my nose. My kids, say, get my kids say, Daddy, there's ferns here. Run your hand. And it's like, uh, you know, and it's all. They remember. A, yeah, yeah. They, there's ferns. Look, run your hand. You know, and it's funny. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. So it's, it's funny, it's, it's interesting now that you say that it's almost like food is often seen as secondary. It's something that we need to do to exist in the purpose of what we're trying to achieve. But food is at the center of our economies. Food is at the center of our health. Food is the center of the crisis that we're having now in terms of the macrobiome and the microbiome. And, and, the it's, and it's, it all starts with what we eat. And it's like every time we eat, there's such agency. It's a vote for the system that we want to create. And we tend to have forgotten that. Because it's, it's, it's just, you go to the supermarket and you kind of follow around and you go, mm, oh, that donut looks nice or that chocolate bar looks nice or whatever. And it's like, there's, there's, so, like, there's such detachment in the oh, whole process, so in the kind of evolutionary process of it. Um, okay, one thing I'd love to move the conversation away slightly is because, you know, we've camped out in Zach's science brain and your rational medical brain, which is like, it's, <laughs> it's up there with chat GPT, like it's off the Richter <laughs> scale, like it really, really is. But there's this whole other part to Zach, which is this curious spiritual man that has incredible, you know, wisdom as well. You know, and it's almost like they're two opposing forces. Like you've got this hyper rational, like you link things there that I'm going, oh my God, I have no idea. You know, it sounds wonderful. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, it sounds great. But then there's this whole much deeper, I, can't, I don't even know, deeper, narrow or shallow or whatever, this whole other side of you, which is a deeply spiritual person that has such connection and curiosity about life and what our purpose is and how, our, how we evolve, like, our own internal journeys. And I'd love to move the conversation to this because beyond, like, you touched on energy, like, you know, we're essentially human batteries that are going around and energy and, like, to move the conversation into a more spiritual aspect and kind of going, well, how do we how do we live more at peace with one another? Because we're all on this journey as human beings going, how do we find more joy? How do we find more love in ourselves? Because ultimately, our, it, like, you know, what we've talked about here is that the internal reflects the external to some degree. And I think each of us have agency within ourselves to go, well, how do I find more peace and harmony within myself and more love and acceptance within myself? Because when I probably find this place is I will influence via microbe microbial biome I don't know what words to use but we're all influencing one another and the greater planet at large and ultimately it's when I think of some of the big issues today you know I think of capitalism and I think of climate change like oh geez I'm just a little peon I'm a little you know puny little human and, but I kind of go well I can probably take agency myself and if I focus on myself and find more love more joy more peace more harmony and deal with some of the issues with myself I'm more likely to influence those around me and I'm gone on a rant now and I shut up <laughs> oh, to you, Zach. Mm, so good. I, I'm glad for that one. That was beautiful. Yeah, it's an opportunity, I guess, to back to maybe the the first moment of life in some ways. You know, the, again, been just blessed with these little babies that you guys have exposed me to. Congratulations. You're about to have another one. Um, just Thank you. crazy to imagine, you know, th that process that's afoot in your wife's belly. Um we have the womb of a woman that's that's this epicenter for a creative process that's not really cellular in its origin. And so all this talk about 70 trillion cells and all this and viruses, and it's all very mind-blowing, astronomically complex, but it's still not the origin of life, you know? And so what is the origin of life? And this is where my medical career started, was birthing babies in the Philippines. And 
the group of midwives there and the, the experience of watching a, a, a child birth in the most abject of poverty, you know, you're in dirt floors and tin shacks and monsoon season with rivers of water running through the, the bedroom, mud everywhere. And this woman's giving birth on a, on a slim little mattress on a dirt floor in an environment of, you know, 10 to 50,000 people living in squatter villages. Outstanding. like, why would life come out of this place? You know, what, and yet this being is brought in that is absolutely perfect. 10 toes, 10 perfect fingers, incredible facial structure and tongue, teeth, the, the whole thing all ready to emerge into its full state as an adult human over the, the years to come. And so when you're watching that happen, it's, you know, notable. It's like kind of this miraculous experience. But when you've seen your own child's face for the first time, it's different than seeing just a baby born. Somehow when you see this thing brought forward from the body of your your partner, yourself, this thing comes out. I think that's where you switch from this biologic awe to this spiritual awe of this being is looking at me. And you can feel seen by that infant in a way that you've never seen yourself. And so there's something about the energetic state of being an infant that is plugged into something greater than the biologic expression of a, a human identity. And then that seems to fade, you know, pretty quickly over the next couple of years. And the kid takes on more and more physical properties of the human and starts to lose some of that bizarre spiritual realm stuff. And it's not really until the end of life do you see the reemergence of this magical being again. And in my hospice work, I got to see that infant-like quality to people and with end-stage Alzheimer's or cancer or whatever it was. And then those last few minutes, they start to look at you just as an infant does, which is they look above your head. And they're not looking in your eyes anymore. They're looking at the energy field that is perhaps and animating kind of your body. Consciously, it's not even conscious. Yeah, they're they're out. You know, they're probably nonverbal for years or months or hours, and so they're not. Yeah, they're no longer in the five senses. They're experiencing some other version of being witness to to life. And so you see those same kind of expressions at that first moment of life and at the last few moments of life. And it's, and it's a reminder to us that in that womb of a woman that a, a child is about to um, you know, occur, there has to be some sort of original math in there. There has to be some sort of template that is held in that space that's energetic before it's cellular. Because the first few cells start to migrate to very specific locations on their own. They self-organize into the hard palate first. It's very strange, but the first thing to form in an embryo is actually the hard palate at the top like of the, the mouth. Wow. And so that thing becomes the foundation for all of the rest of the structure of this infant to be organized around. And the cells have to migrate out into space. They're migrating away from each other, out into space until they find their home. And then they stop. And that becomes you know, the periphery of the, the palate. And then you know, rudimentary mucosa, which would be the gums, and then rudimentary teeth that start to set up shop inside the bone. All these cells are migrating through space and time, literally through vacuum space initially. There's no, there's no cells helping each other along. It's literally, they know where to go. And so that's showing us what the original math of life is, and it's energetic, not cellular. And when I say energetic, I'm really talking about an atomic field. So at the atomic level of atoms lining up in vacuum space, there's some sort of original organization. And so if this is the womb of human, when that those two cells come together, a sperm and an ovum come together, somehow it turns on the understanding or the original blueprint in space time around it. And it knows now what it's going to go form. The kidney cells know where to go migrate to to become future kidneys. They're not kidney cells initially. They're just copies of the same cells. They're pluripotent stem cells. So you basically have this pool of all identical cells that start to migrate out to space time. And then as soon as they get to their home, Boom, the they change. transmute. It's almost like this innate intelligence, like this absolute, absolute in intelligence that is not cellular is the important thing. Okay. It's not biologic. It's atomic. It's down at the energy field Atomic level. mean explosive and... At the, at the atom, atom, level. atom Atom level, yeah. At the atom level. 
And so it's hard to matter even commute with is, our brains. Matter is somehow following some template that's probably even before the atom is lining up. It's probably in the electromagnetic field of vacuum space. And so the vacuum space of all things, which is 99.99% of all things, this microphone is 99.99% vacuum space and 0.001% <laughs> solid. And so everything is actually vacuum. That's Same organizing energy. You, Steve, we're all just a vacuum. I'm just a vacuum that's concentrating energy in a very finite fashion. And so the difference between here and here is the amount of energy per As cubic in the air in your face. centimeter. Yeah. yeah. And so the reason this feels relatively solid is because the amount of energy that's been packed in there. And it's an enormous amount of energy. The, the, we were mentioning the mitochondria and that, their ability to, to, to release sunlight, which is to say kind of the ethereal energy, this physics energy from biology. And this is really indicative of this extraordinary reality of what is life, which is such an interesting, you know, age old question from the philosophers, but we're starting to get a glimpse of what that is. Life is simply concentrated energy. The sun is a, is one of the most powerful physics phenomenon in, in our universe. It's a nuclear fusion fission event where you're getting this breaking of nuclear material apart and it's releasing massive amounts of radiant energy into the cosmos around it and that comes and hits the surface of our planet but if you take one cubic centimeter of the sun's surface which is you know, the most powerful energy source in physics and then you compare that to one cubic centimeter of mitochondria that are releasing light energy the mitochondria are releasing 10,000 times more light than the surface of the sun and th these are mitochondria in each of our cells. 10 billion cells or seven tr 70 trillion you know. 70 trillion yeah quite a few yeah a few yeah. zeros missing there. So, so okay, so the mitochondria is like 10,000 suns in our cells. So we... Yeah, one cubic centimeter of mitochondria, which is about one cubic centimeter of human tissue because 200 mitochondria inside every cell is pretty much packed. It's, it's pretty much your entire cytoplasm is filled with mitochondria. And so, you know, but it's just to give you an example of just how efficient life is at releasing Sorry, energy know. or focusing energy so, 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 so that so that really does make us essentially you know at an atomic level we are you know massive energy like just pulsing energy like suns where human suns light to some degree a, a light being i like that that sounds cool <laughs> you're a light being yeah it's a, some sort of marvel superhero thing right and right. so you're releasing ten thousand times more light per cubic centimeter at the mitochondrial level than the surface of the sun what's the difference between physics and biology 10,000 times more energy per cubic centimeter. Life is this, this extraordinary organization of energy, super dense and super, super hypercharged. Okay, know? to your rational scientist mind, because even there, so okay, so if we're all light beings and we're all essentially at, a net, at an atomic level, we are all energy. Like there's, all, like there's just energy between the air, between m m this physical body, Stephen's physical body, your physical body. It's just vibrating. The energy is vibrating at a much quicker level. And I'm kind of going like, here we are. We, we're in this experience called life. We're all living out the programs to some degree, which we've been fed from society. You know, I need to get a job. And I need to have abs. and I need to be attractive. and I need to be successful. And we're living out all these kind of things to, to various degrees. And some of us are more aware of them. Some of us are less aware of them. And I'm kind of going um, like you know, energetically, like what we, if we're all energetic beings, we're all essentially like radio towers that are pulsing out energy and life at an energetic level is meeting us back with where we're at. So if I'm, if I'm in a state of pain and suffering at an energetic level, the likelihood is that the greater field of energy will meet me back with the same of where I'm at. Whereas if I'm in this creative, expansive, visionary space you know in a moment in time life is probably likely to meet me back with this and this i guess comes back to conscious creating it comes back to manifesting whatever kind of word you want to use for it but even einstein kind of said who's a very rational you know one of the geniuses Father of our of time <laughs> and he's even he he has some expression if you look it up it I, i'm going to butcher it now but essentially that you know it's just basic physics that if you energetically ha set your yourself to a certain vibration it you know the universe will only match it yeah yeah, we are very, very powerful tuning forks, basically. And so you, you, you pound a tuning fork in the, the key of A in the middle of an orchestra, and all the A strings will start vibrating on all of the instruments. And so you haven't plucked the piano string, you haven't plucked the violin string, 
but if it's capable of vibrating in the key of A, it's going to be vibrating just because that one tuning fork sent a vibration into the, and that, that thing's tiny. It's this big, sits in the conductor's hand, he bongs that thing, and all the strings for it's gone. You know, 100 meters goes buzzing. And we're the same thing, but we're bigger and louder. And so we are these extraordinary tuning forks that are tuning the energy around us. And this is where it's so important for us to realize that, you know, there's many indigenous, you know, quotes here that we could go in almost any people group and, and give you a ver version of this. But it's this interesting reality that has been spoken that humans are not made of cells, they're made of stories. The stories that we live by set the vibration of the frequency by which we vibrate. And so we will vibrate at the same energy of the stories we tell each other. And right now we're at a scary point in history, or maybe the greatest opportunity we've ever had, which is we can tell stories simultaneously to 4 billion people at a time because they all have a smartphone. And so we had an interesting experiment a couple of years ago where we blasted out to the world a really strong narrative that there's a new virus that's going to kill the planet. This might kill millions and millions of people. And so you better get ready because this thing is going to be the worst thing that's happened to public health. And so you better go hide. You better go get out of nature. You better go you know, hide away in your homes. Don't, don't be social. Don't talk to fear, fear your neighbors, fear your own relatives. Let your, let your old people die in the hospitals alone because it's too dangerous to be there. So we, I mean, that was a level of fear we've never seen before. We had doctor, we had situations where doctors and nurses weren't going into a dying patient's room. That's never happened in my lifetime. I don't know if it's happened in any lifetime. We are the, 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 the Marines of, of the battlefield of health. And by God, if somebody's sick, we're going in, we're going to go try to save them. Don't leave a single body on the battlefield is that Marine, you know, kind of quote and this is kind of this is who we are as doctors and nurses and that we were so petrified with fear that we wouldn't go into those rooms it's never happened at that level and so we bonged this tuning fork of fear harder and louder than we've ever done it before and it led to a lot of short and long-term consequences in regards to our public health and lots of other things but we immediately saw increase in substance abuse the addiction pattern uh, really accelerated in that space and time. The amount of domestic violence, the amount of child abuse, the amount of sexual abuse in the homes, the amount of, you know, really the, the destruction of social fabric started to come it's apart in our gets, isolation. Pain got magnified. Increasing pain, increasing addiction on opioids, the whole thing. So all of that was fear attracting those low energy events to it you know and so the, i think that y you you live a life of fear you're going to now look for stories that justify the way that you feel inside and that's something that kind of bothers me about this recent situation that we called a pandemic of a virus but the speed at which we adopted that fear narrative i think was symptomatic of the way we were feeling before the pandemic we all had this deep fear in us that that we were failing as a species that our obesity, our chronic pain syndromes, our chronic fatigue syndromes, our Lyme disease, you know, whatever we've blamed it on, our biology is actively failing. The cancer, the autoimmune disease, the, the neurologic conditions, the autism in our children, the attention deficit, like we have this fear that, that biology is failing. And so somebody comes along and says, here's a scary narrative about fear about biology, but it's outside of you. In some ways, there's a huge relief of like, oh, this is fault. why I'm afraid. It's not my fault. I don't have any responsibility for this. When just moments ago, you knew that your lifestyle was shaping your own decline, but you didn't know how to get out of it. And so you felt like you were your own problem and you were the the cause of your own so, demise. So, so how do we turn this power for good? Because obviously, you know, 4 billion people and this fear kind of message went and it kind of it almost compounded, it compounded over time. And here we are, we've got the same agency right now and we can use this gift, which we all have. We are, as you said, at a physical level, using physics, not some woo-woo science. You know, we are energetic beings that are, as you said, like tuning forks that however we are will impact others and can ripple out and catalyze positive change just as much as it can catalyze fear. How do we collectively use this now to change, to turn the tide because... There's a lot of pain on the planet. There's a lot of, you know, suffering. There's, you know, uh, like you were the first one that I heard talk about this sixth great extinction event, which is a possibility 
you know, and some people will say a product probability and you're kind of going, well, here we are, we've got this opportunity right now, you know, and we can influence it, each of us as an individual. And how would we inspire one another, anyone listening, anyone in this room, how do we inspire one another to, to be the, the, the positive catalyst, the force for good that we have agency as individuals? The fact that this is the sixth extinction is really good news because there's been five other extinctions on the planet, that means. And look at how much life and beauty is on the planet. And so there's a beautiful silver lining to extinctions is that life always comes back more diverse and more beautiful and more intelligent every time. And so it takes an extinction event to make these paradigm leaps forward. At the very beginning, we were talking about sickness needs to be a new HR, needs a new, new PR new campaign. So you need to rebrand sickness. Extinction needs needs a new PR is company that the same as, as well. Death, then? Extinction and death. Extinction is, and death are the same thing. And the beautiful thing that you find out in hospice is there's no such thing as an endpoint in death. It's only a rebirth. And people are releasing into something bigger than the physical body was able to express when they let go of the physical body. And so there's this expansion, this this release, this freedom that happens to that energetic field that coded for that body to be in that grid template for a moment and line up all the cells over and over again. And we have to do that throughout our lives. That's not something that just happens in the womb. We have to take those same stem cells and replace our body constantly. My whole gut lining to tennis courts and surface area completely replaces itself every three days. Wow, every three days. Two tennis courts and surface area of cells replaces Just itself rebuild. So the every capacity three days. for rebirth, you know that word, it sounds a bit hippie and we will rebirth, you can rebirth yourself in word. every moment, but there is an actual truth to it at a cellular level. Absolutely, brand new cells every three days. And so your gut's new every day. And this is interesting when you start to look at diseases of the gut, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or things like this. Those people will suffer with a gut disease for decades how is that possible if their gut's brand new every three days? Why, how are they transporting forward a disease if they have a brand new gut every three days? And the answer is back around that, that tuning fork phenomenon. The cells are lining up in disease. The memory of disease is held by the vibration of the overall organism. So how do we clean the slate? How do we kind of wipe these hard drives of these memories it's like it is that you, you know like you said earlier you not in this podcast but you said each millionth of a second at an atomic level we are reborn yeah you know and that was that was a physics you know that's that the was, quantum physics reality of life yeah yeah so the cells are turning over every three days in my gut but like you said the atoms that form those cells and there's billions of atoms in every single cell and so the billions of atoms are disappearing and reappearing every millionth of a second to create the, the physical expression of the energetic template. So the energy field is held in the vacuum space and we keep emerging from the vacuum space, disappearing, reappearing with the original information as to, oh yeah, this is where the gut lining is right here. Here's where the kidney is over here. So we are accessing the original math and then jumping back into the physical body. But if the physical body is carrying all of this memory of the past, and that's the dominant narrative at the biology, that starts to really sh dis disform the original math or create a bunch of static between our original design and who we're expressing today. And I believe that the main way in which we perturb the original design is through emotions, stored emotions. And so how do you set yourself in motion towards a completely new template? You need to erase the emotional patterns that were stored in your water structure ultimately. And so our water of our body is the perfect memory bank. Water is the only molecule that has extraordinary memory to it. Um, all the other molecules are agnostic to past and future. They're just right now. Water has this amazing capacity for memory. And this is why things like homeopathy work. You can expose water to plant, uh, medicine within a plant. You could take curcumin or something like this and you know shake it 100 times and then take one drop of that and put it in water. And do that a few times, five or six times. There's now not a single atomic you know, molecule of uh, atomic or molecular memory or piece of the, the curcumin in there. But the water each time has transferred the memory of curcumin to the next batch of water. And wow. so while there was no, none of the original medicine in, in the water, the water has transported the memory of that thing forward. 
And so we store some sort of memory of, of energy in water and emotions are these powerful changing, you know, field benders of the water. And this has been shown in plants now. Yeah, I remember Masaru yeah. Emoto, the water guy who was... Dr. Emoto's work, yeah. Dr. Emoto is interesting. He he was doing, you know, freeze fracturing of water. And there was a lot of cherry picking of data that he, he definitely admitted to. But they were trying to show that, you know, your emotions would change the shape of the, the water the crystal. That water, which was really interesting. It was an interesting demonstration, but I don't know that it was really proof in that it was a very abstract demonstration of it. I think the stuff that really proves it is now they're putting uh, EEG uh, probes on a plant. And so you can put the same probes you'd put on my brain to look at my brain waves and all of that. You can put on a plant, put it back to the EEG machine, and then you walk in and you say something to the plant. And the EEG on the plant changes depending on what you've told it. What's EEG? EEG is electric. Electroencephalogram. Wow, so it's the, it's the measurement of electrical discharge in a neurologic system. Wow. So you're measuring the neurologic system of this plant. And my attitude, my, my emotional energy in particular, so if I am angry at that plant versus send love and gratitude to the plant, totally different result. And it sets the plant in either a positive direction towards growth or a, a detrimental destruction, kind of rotting and kind of dis- I, decomp- I see that with my cats. Decomposition. I, I come in and my cats will, will just sense, like long before I open my mouth, they'll like sometimes I'll come in and if I'm, if I'm in, like, you know, calm, they'll be all over me. They'll be delighted. They'll come near me. If I've got dog energy and I'm excited, they'll run away from me. And if, if I've got anger, they'll just, you know, if I feel upset or if I feel sad, they'll come and mind me. But if there's anger or any of these kind of ones, they'll, they won't come near me again. So animals, I think, and plants have a different it. intelligence. Feel it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. I feel they can almost read my mind, you know. And I think this is maybe the gift of dogs and somewhat is they, they can see all of that. And they're determined to infect you with their enthusiasm still. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, you know what, dude, lighten up. I'm going to come lick your face all over because you seem to be taking yourself too seriously. You, know, you seem to be too stressed out. So dogs have this way of overcoming or perhaps seeing the opportunity to be our medicine. The cat is more our mirror, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. And this is a you want to see what kind of attitude you got? I'm out of here. Yeah, like, and so it's it's a very interesting way that plants and animals can respond to us. And anybody who's worked around horses or any of these other intelligent species, the dolphins, the whales, they all know that they can call these animals to them to by dropping into a space and telepathically communicating. And the bushmen do this all the time in Africa that I've been spending time with. They blow my mind and. Uh, this Bushman of the Kalahari recently I was um, talking to around this campfire one evening and I, I was talking about elephants and that I hadn't seen an elephant's the last couple of days and was really wanting to see an elephant. And he's, he looked at me, he's like, it's very easy to call elephant. You just, he gets down on his hands and knees. He says, you just do this. And so I get down on my hands and knees. He says, now just open up your heart and project love at the ground. And I was like, do I need a picture of an elephant or not? No, no, just project love, project your love onto the ground. And the feet of the elephant will sense that vibration, you know, 100 kilometers away, and they'll start coming to, to, to see who's loving the earth. I was just so dumbfounded by this. Like, this is, this is 40,000 years of wisdom coming out of a Kalahari Bushman on how to talk to elephants. You just open your heart and project it down onto the surface of the earth so that their feet can take that up. And so whether it be the plant or the distant elephant. Or well, the elephant so I, heard, I heard an elephant can smell water from 100 kilometers away. So like Can they, they smell s- it or can they feel uh, it? And, and maybe know, hear it because their ears yeah. are so big, but they can certainly smell it via their trunk because, mm. yeah, I, yeah. It's a beautiful thing. So these animals are so energetically you know, tuned. tuned to their and nature. And we, we must have these capacities as tuning forks. You know, back to the question, like we but are all tuning we're, forks. We're living in our heads too much. And I think that's part of it. It's actually moving the intelligence down from the brain into the body, I think, and into the heart and the gut. That is a huge... Yeah, I think that's probably is, is a huge area that we need to grow to. I, I think if we're going to evolve as a species, and I think one of the challenges, at least something that... I'm becoming more conscious of and aware of is how we can be more surrender to life as opposed to live the kind of script in our head and the things Mm -hmm. that we need and living from this life of somewhat scarcity. I need more. I need to get this. Whereas if you're living and, and using the kind of the concept of living in abundance, living in abundance, there's total trust 
that no matter what you're going through, you'd be taken where you're meant to be. And it's almost like a strong faith, whether it be a religious based faith, whether it be trust in life, whether it be just absolutely, you see a newborn baby and it just sits in its mother's arms and it's in total trust. I think that's our innate being, but I guess through our less than perfect upbringings, many of us have just doubt it's, you know, something we learn from spending time with our indigenous brothers and sisters so quickly. Um, spent time with the Ochoa tribe down in Ecuador a couple of years ago. And the thing that struck me the most about their dwellings, I was a general contractor, built houses, all this. I'm always curious to see what a culture expresses as a dwelling, you know, or what it is. And the thing that most amazed me, like the, the complexity of the overall structure is amazing. Like here they are, their only tool is a machete. They're building surprise of the jungle and they build these incredible, you know, 15, 20 foot vaulted ceilings with incredible, you know, intricate rafter system and then incredible overlay of all the grass, you know, layers and layers of shingles basically. And so you've got this incredibly effective and long lasting house and they start to rebuild another house every 10 years. Um, and so they've got these houses that are very durable in very extreme weathers, you know, monsoon rains and winds and everything else. And they've figured out how to engineer in there. So that all of it is very structurally very similar until you watch them prepare a meal and you realize they have no cupboards. They have no storage devices other than the, the little, you know, uh, basket or, or bucket that they'll store there, the, the saliva that they spit, at, which is the main drink they drink is the the water out of the rivers are not potable because of all the parasites and everything else. And so they ferment uh, these uh, f- different like extreme kombuchas, you would think of them, but they ferment this kind of low alcohol beverage that's sterile because of the amount of fermentation that goes on. So they can... And they use their saliva. So they use their saliva to seed it. And so the women chew these these fruits or seeds and then spit into the and the, uh, vessel all day long. And then this ends up being their their main beverage. Wow. And so that's, that's the only incredible. thing that they actually store is this, this beverage that they're fermenting. Otherwise, they have a fire and then they have, you know, nature. A, a, a nature out there that's their abundance. And so that's this their is, store So they just simply walk out into the jungle every morning and collect whatever's available. And for 40,000 years, that jungle has been feeding this tribe. So talk about an abundance trust. It's like there's no re- reason to store anything because it's all right here every day. For, for as long back as memory can serve, it's always provided for us. And we've never starved because we wouldn't be here if we had. And so that level of trust has totally disappeared in the Western thing. We, we have, I, I'm hardly home. I travel all the time and you go to my cupboards, cans, dried goods, you know, all kinds of stuff. Cause, cause why? Like, cause I believe there's not enough. I'm, I might not have food because I'm not eating from nature again at this point in my life. And so I'm walking into this industrial system that has created scarcity by separating me from nature. And so the very things that we should most, you know, hold in value would certainly be our food and therefore be in an abundant state with our food, therefore be connected to nature. But the second one that kind of gets into your question a little bit about, you know, beyond the biology, what about the spiritual side of things? Love is something that we have outsourced or commoditized in the same way we have canned goods i think you know we have canned love and we've put it in the form of here's an ownership model uh, that we should all ascribe to and you should be the princess or you should be the, the 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 white prince and you all should you know go into this ownership model make sure there's a ring on the finger to show that you own that person they own you and then we do it in families too. Well, I'm the oldest son or I'm the youngest son and I, that's my parents and I, I, I have duty to them before anything else. And, you know, so in different cultures, it's either our spouse or our parents or in some cultures, it's our children that our, our duty is to. And so we can love in these different forms, you know, you've got marriage, you've got sonship, you've got fatherhood and so I got all these different cans of love that I sat on my shelves for years and I tried to store more of them more of them up to prove how loving I was and so I had all this canned goods of love in my life and in the end see those relationships you know taking different chapters and you know married for 20 years or with my first wife for 20 years 18 of those married had two incredible kids and that marriage came to a new season and 
she found a new partner. And when we moved into that next chapter, releasing that, that can ultimately, it was this discovery the can of marriage. Like, yeah. Releasing that love from the can, I guess is a better way of saying it is a, a few weeks into the journey of realizing that she was going to leave this marriage. I, I was, you know, challenging her, I think one night when we we're sitting there late into the night talking through this and of like, what is unconditional? Like, didn't we agree to unconditional love? And that's when I realized, oh my God, I'm the one that's not being unconditional. I put all these conditions on it. I'm only going to love you if you stay owned by me and you make sure that, you, you know, we're, we're more important than all other things in the universe. And we, we're going to hold this can so tightly that we're going to make sure no change happens. I don't want you to change. I'm not going to change. We're going to be, what a bizarre constraint to put on the very person that you've claimed to love more than anyone else. And so I think as I've gotten older and older, I've realized, man, I have canned the most important things in life and therefore lost contact with their original identity, their original design. And I've certainly lost the original design of food as I became more and more of a commoditized modern food eater. And I certainly lost the meaning of love as I canned that stuff more and more aggressively into just a few brands. I monocultured love and I monocultured relationship in my life. And I did that with, you know, me as a doctor. And so that was a huge part of my identity. And that's just been dissolving in recent years where I'm realizing I don't want to only be accessed by people when they're sick or dying. I want to be accessed when people are asking that critical question, when they've come to that turning point of life of like, who could I become today? That's become the place I want I to play. I love that question. Who could I become today? And I want to be in that play box now. I want to be in that sandbox when somebody's asking, if I'm willing to let go of everything I've ever worked for, what should I start to think about? I want to be brainstorming with that person. I want to be like in that game of like, you're right. Like everything you're about to let go of because you had your cancer or you had your sickness and that sickness took you to your knees until you admitted that you probably had been going the wrong direction in life. And maybe there's maybe this thing is the greatest gift you've ever had, which is universally what I ended up hearing in my clinic over the years. When I stopped treating cancer as a disease and started treating cancer as if it was a, a flag towards a different future. As people, in like an opportunity for a different future. It's a change in direction. And there's no bigger one when somebody says you have this horrible thing called cancer and it could kill you. That's a moment where you are willing to quit your job and stop doing the things you don't like doing and start to really reevaluate your priorities. Because what if you only got 18 months left to live? How are you going to live it? And so people start to pivot and start to make different value decisions in their life. And they start to find themselves in that and they start to feel joy. And suddenly they don't die 18 months later. Instead, their cancer goes away and they start to thrive. And so that's where I feel like my greatest joy is now is if we really are going to be... The, the physician to the other, which is ultimately what we're welcomed into or the opportunity we have as community is we can be the best medicine to one another. By holding space for that sovereign being next to you, whether it be a friend or a family member or spouse or a kid, acknowledging that they're on a sovereign journey that may be full of lots of sicknesses or diseases or whatever it is, or lots of joys and lots of you know victories, if we hold space for that and just tell them, you know, I'm going to celebrate every moment you're alive, regardless of what it looks like, regardless of how you show up. And what if we start doing that in a relationship? I am so happy to be with you guys today. It's amazing that we as sovereign beings with lots and lots of people in our field and a whole planet that we can travel to in a split second, we chose to be together today. That's pretty radical. That's a big contract. Of the other 7.8 billion people, I'm going to ignore that and I'm going to be with you guys today. That's a big decision in life right there. And it, it's a value to me that you guys would invite me into your home, sleep in your guest bedrooms, eat your food, tour your food facilities, swim in your ocean with you this morning, sit in, sit in the sauna afterwards with you. Those are, that's the sacredness of life right now. And as I live my life more and more in the moment and understand love to be something that cannot be canned, cannot be repeated. One thing that happens is I take less and less photos, interestingly. Like I used to snap a lot of pictures of like moment to moment stuff. And I've taken more today than I usually do because I've been so excited by your food. So I've taken a bunch of food pictures, but, but 
as far as like taking pictures of myself becomes less and less relevant because you can't actually can that stuff. The experiences I've had today, no matter how many, how many hours I spent trying to explain how beautiful this morning was, it's nobody's going to be able to be there with us. Nobody's going to actually feel what those cold pebbles felt like under our feet before we went, jumped into eight degree weather, you know, water. Nobody, nobody was that wasn't there with us in fellowship will know that beauty. And what a waste of time to distract them with our beauty when they had some beautiful moment this morning. And so it's just abundant. I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning in a different zone, a different mindset. I'm going to be traveling to a different country again, and I'll meet new people that day. And then the next morning I'll wake up with a new moment and time to share space with people who are excited about other things. And I've had so many other experiences, and I can fall in love again. As long as I don't have the tendency to can that stuff up, it will it will continue to be the tuning fork for my next day and my next day. So I want to vibrate to the love I feel in a day rather than try to can that stuff up. And as soon as it's canned, it can't vibrate anymore. It becomes an echo chamber in there in its little can. And so the two most important things that we can start to let free for the human condition is our food and our love. And I think when we do that, we can become increasingly convinced that the reason the food showed up was to be an excuse for the fellowship. A carrot is kind of a weird thing, right? Like, why did a carrot get so beautiful? Like, the damn thing's underground. Like, nothing was going to see that root. Nothing was going to eat that root until it became part of a, a, a community of creatures, two-legged creatures in particular, that found it quite delectable and kind of beautiful to look at. And so we started hybridizing in a bunch of different carrots. We got purple carrots and yellow carrots and orange carrots. And we got this whole carrot thing going on right now. Really good. What's the purpose of the electromagnetic field to design a carrot? Because those carrot cells had to line up in the womb of the soil and become carrot. And it had to do that over and over again, species or, or generation after generation that we would have more and more pleasure from it. Why would it do that? Why would the electromagnetic field design a carrot? Except that Carrots have this incredible way of gathering people. You roast those carrots and maybe you roast some potatoes next to it and you pick some of those greens out of the garden and you throw that on a table, everybody comes flocking because roasted carrots are darn good. Potatoes are freaking delicious. <laughs> that, that arugula we ate, that rocket we ate out of your garden today, spicy and good, like just vibrant. That bowl of food you served me last night with... 17 different flavors in, in a single little vessel there. Blew my mind sitting there watching you guys have fun with your family and laughing at an incredible rugby match as Ireland crushed England. <laughs> so, so good. And so food, I think, was designed ultimately to be by a nature that celebrates fellowship, you know. Food has been shared by all species. And so when you sit down for a meal, you can also remember it's not just the five people gathered around the table. It's 1.4 quadrillion bacteria that are about to feed 14 quadrillion mitochondria that's about to liberate sunlight into your bloodstream again and light you up for what end, to what purpose, so that you freaking love more. And the love is an interesting thing. Love is not an emotion, I don't think. It's a state of being that occurs when you see beauty. And the beauty of carrot is something to, to engender a state of love. The beauty of a meal, the beauty of the sparkle of a candle in the eye of your lover, whatever it is, these are the things that engender the vibration of love when you see any sort of beauty. Time to pay the bills now. Um, as we said, this podcast is sponsored by Vivo Barefoot Shoes. They're really, they're the only shoes we've been wearing for six years. And really, we wouldn't take someone as a sponsor unless we really believe in them. And this is a company and these are shoes that we've seen it in ourselves. Our feet have become more natural. They're stronger. They're wider. I can isolate. There's this kind of movement called toga, which sounds funny and sounds stupid, but it's where you can isolate your toes and move them kind of 
individually. Individually and through wearing shoes, at least there's even research from Vivo at universities that your feet muscles will typically improve by 60% within a number of weeks of just wearing barefoot within shoes. Within 100 days, I think 100 it is. Days, so, and even think about it logically that in a house, the foundation or the base of the house is the really the, the most important bit which the structure sits on. And the same way we kind of, we just wear shoes without thinking about it, yet our feet are the foundation. And when you've got them in shoes that actually encourage the natural kind of movements within your feet it enhances every aspect of your anatomy yeah so uh if anyone does want to try them out uh vivo barefoot are offering a 15 percent off with the code happy pair 15 and you have nothing to worry about they're offering a hundred day return policy so if you don't like your vivo barefoot you can return them free of charge yeah so check them out vivo barefoot.com full range of shoes for all the family from formal to casual to kids um, and everything in between so 15 percent off happy pair 15 Amazing perspective to look at, like, when you were about to say, when you sit down to eat, I was thinking, I think about all the people that were part of the process of getting this food to you, but I've never thought to think about, think of all the bacteria that are in your gut that are dying to eat the food that you're about to eat. So excited. Like, it's just like, oh my, hey, like, yeah. That's yeah the wonderful. sunlight that's going to be released into you, you know, it's, it's just my, yeah, it's not things that I've thought about really. Yeah, well, beautiful. I think, I think it could reshape what you guys do with all of your your business is so vibrant and you you employ so many people uh, and so many families are put bread on their table for the for the vision and industry that you guys have created together in this food production system and you're bringing nutrients in. But it might be interesting to set your people down and and just have them meditate a little bit before work or before a week of work on really our purpose here is to bring more light into humanity. And if that's our purpose, then what are we going to code into that light energy? What, and what, are we, what emotions are we going to put into the water structure that's in that food? Uh, no, nobody has ever missed the, the taste of love. You know, that's always seen, that's always witnessed. And it may not be conscious, but it's certainly physiologically acknowledged because of all the cookies you've ever eaten, was any of them as good as the ones your grandmother fed you, you know? As all the clever things we do in the food industry now, has any of them been as good as the the meal that you ate around the campfire with your dad the first time you went camping? These are the, food just takes on a spiritual quality when it's at the focus of fellowship, and especially fellowship in nature. I'm being overwhelmed right now with just thoughts of my childhood of just like the number of times I had, was blessed to eat in nature. I was, I was a boy scout and, you know, so by 11 or 12 years old, I was every month camping out in the Colorado Rockies and I got really good at camping and cooking and, um, I'm having just this overwhelming experience in my body of, of the sense of joy and self-love that I felt in being in the dark in the Colorado Rockies with fire crackling and smelling onions and you know, herbs sautéing together. And then I'd, I had this little recipe that I do with these little fajitas. And so I made these little chicken fajitas back in the day that I'd sauté up and the whole camp would, would like be around because they all ate beans and franks, you know, and so the, and nobody else was smelling this smell of real things cooking. And so I'd get this stuff sautéing and it was just such a joy to me as a kid to be able to see the effect of food on my friends, you know, and on the people that I, I held as my tribe. And we were doing that around fire and um, they've done some interesting science recently that if you if the eyes look down from the horizon level, and so if you tilt your eyes downward at flame and, and you're seeing the wavelength of fire with that eyes down pitched, it turns on stem cell activation in your whole body. And so just being around fire and looking down into that fire is enough to start a regenerative process in it's your body. It's not surprising because I think about it like in, a, in an evening, like there's a lot of dark evenings in Ireland in the winter and we've got a stove, so we light the fire. And when you light the fire, everyone kind of goes quiet and looks at the fire. For down everyone everyone looks at the fire. It's like an old school TV, like it was the first prehistoric television fire because you look at it and it's crackling and dancing and it's enchanting and it brings you back into a state of presence like it does because you, you can't help but marvel at it. It's marvellous. Like just the dancing, the beauty, the 
What, what is the it? heck? What? <laughs> this is amazing. It's, and it's getting warmer in here. Woohoo! It's sunlight being released from the log. That's what fire is. <laughs> so fire is the process of liberating light energy from wood. And we're the only species to ever master that skill. And so in, as we look at the regeneration of the planet, you know, we're spending a lot of time now traveling around the world with this vision of, like you asked, now that we know that fear can set us in one motion, what is the next vision that we're going to choose to look at? And for me, it's going to be, you know, really this vision of how humans could be the fourth element of nature, soil, water, wind, and fire were the four elements long recognized. Soil, water, and air are how biology happens. Fire is the great destroyer, which is to say the great tablet for rebirth. I think humans are the fire in that four element play. And so uh, we don't actually have to figure out how to regenerate soil or water or air. Stuff's been regenerating itself since the beginning of time. And there have simply been far more toxic times on this planet than we have today. Acid pools, acid rain. I mean, this was a noxious planet to begin with, and it has slowly emerged with the capacity to hold life because soil and water and air became a thing. We developed complex soil systems over billions of years of death and composting and turnover. And in the same way, the air was ultimately cleaned by that vibrant soil system. The waters became pure for its dance with the carbon in the, in the soil systems. So this is planet's been regenerating since its origin and generating towards something more pure, more, more holistic in its dance, and therefore more capable of holding more biodiversity and more intelligence after every single extinction event. And so here we are today, and we could hold the possibility of being a part of the next revolution of life on Earth as we emerge from this extinction event. Maybe we can, maybe we can halt this march towards extinction and only lose 60 or 70 percent of life instead of 90 95 percent of life as the other extinctions have happened and so if we realize that we have a role in in the future of regreening this planet to reverse the desertification or reverse the collapse of soil systems and our participation could could he could be part of that revolution the only thing that needs regenerating in those four elements is is the fire. And, and, and you, you, you like even just human. to land things and make things really practical. You like uh, this is glorious. It's absolutely glorious. And we have to talk about your project biome because, like you know, you, you can articulate things at a macro level incredibly. But you are not just like a, a thinker on this. You have created a not for profit, which is. It's about returning the Sahara and many of these deserts green. It's got this massively ambitious goal over the next 20 years to try to turn some of the biggest deserts in the planet to make them green again. Yeah, and this isn't just held by me. This is really a lot of individuals and agronomists and you know biologists on the planet understand that this planet has been through many cycles of desertification and then regreening. It's a basically a 7,000 year cycle. And so 7,000 years ago, the Sahara was one of the most green places on the planet. And now it's the largest desert in the world. And 14,000 years ago, it was also one of the greenest places on earth. But between those, those green you know, heights of the planet, there was great deserts. And so the desertification ran from 14,000 years ago to about 10,000 years ago and then regreened again. And so we are right at the bottom of the desertification process right now. And so left to its own, the earth is going to regreen again. And the Three Sahara, and Saudi years. Arabia, Siberia is all going to go green again. And so it'll just take another 3,500 years, 7,000 years, somewhere in that range for us to get back to a green, green earth with the planet left to its devices. Right now, we have set ourselves to, in, in, as an antithesis or as, as a enemy of that recovery through our agricultural system. So our agricultural system is based on chemical agriculture, which wipe out the microbiome through the herbicides, pesticides. We're using that heavily throughout Africa now. And so we're using those chemicals to destroy ecosystems in the name of food. And so we're replacing the peasant farmers that have been feeding their people for 40,000 years saying, ah, y'all are failing because the desert's there. We need large scale genetically modified crops that are drought resistant. And so 
we move into these countries with all this technology and seeds and promise and and then within seven to 10 years, we've destroyed the soil systems that, that had been feeding them for 40,000 years and the desert advances and the desert advances. And so the Sahara is marching south very quickly, both for natural causes as well as now, you know, industrial chemical agricultural per, um, influences. And so as that desert continues to march and we continue to chop down forests to raise more cattle and more GMO seed, which we're doing in South America, we're doing in Africa, Right now, we're just, you know, fueling the fire on on this phenomenon of desertification. But there's many people that have been in this regenerative agriculture movement to realize that our behavior as agronomists, as food growers, can put ourselves in harmony with the earth rather than an antagonist to it. And so as we're starting to understand how to do crop rotation, cover cropping, making sure the soil is always covered with biologic material, as you were you know, was describing, instead of you know throwing all the weeds out or burning them, we're leaving them on the top of the soil to return those nutrients into it. The, as we start to do this, we could radically accelerate this explosion of, of greening of Africa and Saudi Arabia and the rest. That's naturally going to happen to this planet once we're gone, once we, if we chemical or agriculture ourselves to death planet will recover in just a few thousand years. But if we stay to play, if we decide to change and, and harmonize with our planet, our very actions at every level could become a solution. So there's, for us, three phases of recovery that have to be recognized. One is rewilding river systems where you get keystone species back in there. In the United States, this has been done really effectively with beavers and wolves. You put those keystone species back into a habitat and immediately the rivers start to flow again. In Africa, it's been shown to be effective with things like the elephant, the hippo, the, the crocodile, these keystone species being put back in, and they can regenerate the water system very quickly through their intelligent design. And so there, these species are going to be key to it, which means we're going to have to take down many of the fences that were put up in the name of conservation. So we create all these conservation reserves with rich people coming in from all over the world to save Africa. And in so doing, they took all the land away from the indigenous people and walled up these, these compounds that animals can't migrate through anymore. And so in the name of conservation, we've done great harm to people's and habitats. And so we're gonna have to revise that model and we're gonna have to start taking down fences and allowing animals to move again and reintroduce animals where they've maybe gone extinct or endangered and get them repopulating. And not just the, the animals, but also the peoples. We're gonna have to return river systems and coastlines, not only to the keystone species, but also to the indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples like the Achua tribe have been again in relationship with their forest for 40,000 years, and there's been no destruction of the forest. They're in a, a harmonized relationship to it. They've figured out how to live within that in an abundant state. And the same, and on a global level, we find that 90, what is it, 80% of all biodiversity is now managed in the very few little lands left that are inhabited and managed by indigenous peoples. 80% of biodiversity protected wow. by 3% of humans. We've wiped out 97% of indigenous peoples over the last couple hundred years of, of empire building and colonialism and all of this. And so we've got this opportunity right now to not just rewild our species of animals, but really rewild humanity itself back into its original form with culture and uh, wisdoms that have long been in harmony with this planet. And so allowing indigenous peoples to take back the lands that are most critical to this biologic cycle of water and carbon means we're gonna have to rewild river systems and coastlines with indigenous wisdom. Too few people to probably fill all that space. And so instead we maybe set up cultural centers and education centers throughout these habitats where we can start to relearn the indigenous roots that are in all of us. We're all indigenous to planet Earth, as it turns out. There's no othering of indigenous. We're all indigenous. That's a good point. With the exception of the fact that we just forgot the behaviors, right? And so there's either indigenous who remember what that means or there's indigenous who've forgotten. And indigenous that are still connected to the planet versus we're more urban. Yeah. Urban indigenous yeah. disconnected in disconnected, general. Disconnected, yeah. Wow. So, so it's called Biome and it's a not, not for profit that has this mass, this massive um, goal of really regreening the Sahara in far quicker than three and a half thousand, thousand years. years. Yeah. 
Yeah, in, and in, I think in, 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 in addition decades. to the rewilding, then regenerative agriculture becomes a big piece. So this was our first effort with Project Biome was a project called Farmer's Footprint, which has now taken hold pretty well. We we launched Farmer's Footprint in the U.S. five years ago, and then we launched Australia last year, and we're launching U.K. this week, and plan to launch New Zealand and probably South Africa this year. And so then we're starting to see real traction with this message of regenerative food systems as a, a new foundation for food economics and, and agriculture. And so Farmers Footprint um, can get you a lot of information there. Farmersfootprint.us or farmersfootprint.org.au um, can get you a lot of information on this space of how you can become part of a regenerative food system. And you guys are certainly working to do this by creating consumer products that are built from regenerative organic wheat, your bread that we had this morning and things like that. So there's an opportunity for us as food commodities producers to be part of the, the solution by creating demand for ingredients that are grown in a fashion that supports soil systems, which is really the the one word <laughs> definition of regenerative is reconnection. So reconnecting at every level of the food system to its original nature, reconnecting ultimately to the soil and water cycles. And when your farmers go out in the morning with the primary goal of growing more soil instead of killing the next bug, you know, that you end up with a much different farmer. Growing one more that, soil is a very different way of thinking of it, like just feeding the soil and therefore it'll feed yeah. whatever kind of food you're looking for. That's right. So instead of going out to figure out what you need to kill so that you can produce a certain number of bushels of corn, you go out to, to produce soil so that you can create abundance of diversity within those fields. And uh, there's a huge opportunity there. So Farmers for Print and then Project Biome, which is the re rewilding systems and then regenerative agriculture. And then the third piece of that is what we're calling regenerative technologies. We need to start to redesign our energy systems, our information technology, our housing systems, our, our design of prisons and schools and nursing homes. All of these need to be redesigned into natural systems. And so we need to start doing biomimicry in all areas of human device. And this will be an exciting kind of redefinition of nature, if you will. I think I mentioned to you guys yesterday that the Oxford English Dictionary, which is your oppressors, of course, but the, the Oxford English Dictionary tells us that nature is everything on the planet, including minerals, plants, animals, everything except for humans or all that humans have made. And so the Oxford Dictionary has written humans and all of our ingenuity out of nature. And it's for that separation that we have become such a noxious, you know, stimulus to nature. By reimagining ourselves back into nature at every level, what will our cars look like when we truly understand natural cycles of carbon and water? They're going to run on either carbon or water. They're not going to run on lithium batteries and the rest because that's not. There's no energy cycle for lithium on the planet. Run on carbon or water. It's such a trippy thing to even think of that. Like, I'll oh, just go, like you know, get some water. Like five here, liters of water. In the car. Here. And carbon, like, where do I find carbon? No. Like, I know it's like I'm like as a human body is made of carbon, and plants are mostly carbon and soil. soil. And, like, it seems like the planet is mostly carbon, but like I can't go. I, I've never seen carbon. Maybe coal is. The coal. Coal, coal is carbon. There's one you put in your car every day, though. Well, maybe not yours. Petrol. you got an electric car, but yeah. petrol. Yeah. So petrol is just carbon. And so when we learn to close that carbon cycle, where as soon as carbon is burned in the, in the fuel, as a fuel source, it's immediately returned to soil and plant next door. And so understanding our soil systems is a relationship to your car, is a relationship to the petrol there, is a relationship to the coal that might be burning a coal power, power plant down the road. When we start to understand the cycle of carbon as a good thing, as as an actual abundant source of energy for the planet, rather than just thinking, well, we need every drop of fossil soil out of the earth, and then we're going to run out. That's the scarcity model of, of oil and carbon. The abundant model of carbon is realized, like you said, well, wait, that, that oil was simply soil, you know, a few million years ago. And so why aren't we, you know, catching that early on in the cycle? And we can now do that. And so we can take... The, the leftover plant matter, the biomass from farming, which could be wheat straw, rice straw, bagasse from sugar cane or the hemp cane, all, uh, corn cobs, all of this biomass that's left over after we've eaten, and we can turn that directly into oil. And so that can become that closed carbon loop where farmers are actually our energy, not just our food, but also our energy sector for our transportation and distribution model and whatnot. So farms should be able to do closed carbon loops in the future. And so 
these are the technologies that I have great joy in, in imagining and then helping bring to market because this, this means that farmers are no longer just trying to sell 40 bushels of corn. They're also selling oil from their fields into the carbon source and then they're regenerative soil call, is taking that. What do you call it again where you're using the likes of biomass and turning it into some type of oil, biodiesel or whatnot? Yeah, pyrolysis is the name yeah. of that technology. Yeah, yeah. Jeez, that sounds really cool. It sounds very local and less dependent on... Yeah, yeah, we'd have a decentralized energy sector for the first time. Yeah. I'd say a few people wouldn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> there might be a bit of resistance to the people that hold all the chips at the moment. There used to be, but it, that's really changed in recent years. So if, this is where... Again, re-envisioning a future together can quickly create change. And so, the together, I think, is the key word there. Yeah, together. And so governments have now come together and agreed that, that CO2 is a problem, which is hilarious because it's actually the only fuel on the planet for life to happen. And so the demonization of CO2, completely biologically inaccurate, needs to be recorrected. Carbon and oxygen, CO2. Yeah, carbon. I mean, CO2 is the building block for all glucose and fatty acids to store light energy. So... It's the only way to get sunshine into life forms is through the transit of CO2 into plants. CO2 is our gift. It is the way in which we run. It's the only thing that human cells need to run on. This is very bizarre because you've been told that you breathe oxygen. But it turns out, and you've been told that trees breathe CO2 and you breathe oxygen. Right? Yeah, yeah. You're different than a tree. It's not true at all. So it turns out that when we incubate human cells in our laboratory or any cell biology lab around the world, you put it into a hermetically sealed you know, container so there's no exchange with atmospheric air. And like this refrigerator here, as soon as you shut that, it's a closed system. If you start growing cells in there, it's going to start using up the ambient air in there very quickly. So you need to start replacing some of the gas that's in the air back into that thing. So you better get some oxygen in there. Except if you put oxygen into an incubator, you kill the cells almost immediately. You can't put oxygen into human cell culture. Instead, the only gas that you have to pump in there is CO2. Wow. And so we've been told this lie about CO2 is like the waste product of human biology. It is the fuel for human biology just as much as it is the plant. Oxygen that's allows now, us to use more carbon over time. That's a head screw now right there. Now that's a... There's a big unraveling there. Yeah, big in back in there, even, even only recently did I, was I aware that it's an interplay, the carbon and the oxygen, to, or the carbon dioxide and breath, the oxygen in terms, in terms of breath, breath that they're both vital. And it's it's it, it's a kind of a, a bi-cycle. It's the two Symbiotic of them. Symbiotic relationship. Yeah, yeah, between CO2 and oxygen in terms of The oxygen alive. is basically the foot on the accelerator pedal and the carbon is the gas in the gas tank. And so you, the more oxygen you have, the faster you're going to use up your carbon. And so when we pump CO2 into an incubator without any oxygen, it uses the carbon at a pretty base level. It's not churning through the CO2. If you start adding oxygen, it's going to churn through the CO2 faster. And so oxygen is not the, the thing that we run on. It's the thing that accelerates our biology. But CO2 is ultimately what we run on. And so, like I said, we have a frustratingly backwards belief about CO2 in the atmosphere as being our cause of climate change and all this it's not at all cause of our climate change cause of our climate change is the death of soil systems which has broken the carbon loop that co2 is the promise of a green africa a green saudi arabia a green siberia and so that co2 is the reason we're going to thrive as a planet again as it has many times so that's not our problem it's our greatest opportunity and we have more available than ever before because, thank God, humans came along and innovated companies like BP, Shell, you know, all of these oil companies that pumped all of that carbon out from these fossil soil aquifers that weren't available to the atmosphere before. And so we now have more carbon available to biology than any other time in history. So when we go green with this planet again... It could be the most verdant this planet's ever been. Because what happens is that they'll extract the carbon. So, like, just let me try to, because this is a total reframing and par total paradigm shift, and I'm just trying to relay it back to you to, to, to see if I've got it correct. That it's like, because there's so much carbon in the atmosphere, there's such potential for life to prosper like never before. Like never before. And that's and because plants absorb carbon. Because there's more carbon available, because we've gotten it out of the earth and where it's all in the atmosphere now because we dug all the oil out of the earth. We dug all the coal, coal out of the earth. Every time we get coal and oil out of the earth, we are offering more opportunity for today's soils to be richer than they ever have been. 
The only reason they're not is because we're treating them so abusively with herbicides, pesticides. As soon as we stop that, there's more carbon available than any time in history for today's soils and plant systems. So it's very exciting. So soak up that so carbon they, and so bring the, it. The opportunity, a bit like, you know, we talked to the very start, there's the paradigm shift about viruses being bad, but viruses being an update and an opportunity for, you know, transformation in the same way sickness, and you talked about sickness and death, and you've kind of re- you know, you've given a paradigm shift to all them. It's the same way the opportunity now in the current state of climate crisis, which those are the words, the fear kind of language around it. There's a huge opportunity here for massive biodiversity if we can, you know, stop using chemical farming methods and allow our soils to replenish and allow biodiversity to, to naturally unfold because as these natural, as nature takes over, it will start to pull that carbon from the atmosphere and sink it back into the soil again and the full carbon water air cycle just kicks in. Yeah. And with more genetic potential that's ever been on the planet. Because when you put species under extinction level stress, they start making more viruses, more genetic potential, because they're trying to escape the threat of collapse. And they're trying to figure out which biology would live on the earth that's no longer amenable to life under its current form. And so with the last extinction, we went from palms and ferns as the only plant life at the macro level to a great extinction event. All those plants going extinct put out a bunch of new genetic information and a few million years later, we have a planet covered with deciduous trees, wildflowers. These never existed before. It Animals. was the imagination of nature in her death that allowed these to occur. It was the imagination of nature in her death of extinction that imagined life more beautiful, more diverse, and more intelligent. And so we went from dinosaurs to birds, mammals, humans because there was an extinction event. The human genome is very simple. There's only 20,000 genes. It's a pathetically simple gene, genome. Fruit fly has 13,000 genes. A flea has 30,000 genes. How many do we have? We've 10, 20, 20, we've got less than a fruit, than a... You're between a flea and a fruit fly. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, bro. Wow, <laughs> super impressive. No wonder I get stuck sometimes. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Big words. That's what I tell all, the, all women in particular, to give your guy a break because he's only got 20,000 genes. He's somewhere between a flea and a fruit fly. And <laughs> suddenly the just expectations ratchet down a little bit. <laughs> like, all right, you for, forgot the keys again. So what does this mean? How, how is it that we're so damn intelligent? How, if we only have 20,000 genes, then what is making us intelligent? How is it possible Viruses? that a human body is that? Viruses are an interesting piece of the Microbiome. puzzle. So it tells us that the, of the 20,000 genes we have, more than 10,000, more than 50% of them were direct inserts from viruses. And so we took up 10,000 new viruses to code a new genome that we would call human. And that was the jump to m mammals. And so not just human, but all mammals had to get these 10,000 new genes to move us from reptiles that gave birth through eggs to live birth. And these genes were critical updates. These weren't like viruses that came in and just like made us have brown hair instead of white hair. These are viruses that allowed us to develop a placenta. These were viruses that allowed us to, to release the mitochondria from the sperm of this from before it goes and infects the ovum with its human DNA. These were critical biologic updates that allowed live birth to occur. Those were viruses that we picked up from the environment after the great extinction event that it would allow a dolphin or a blue whale or a human to exist. And so the genes made new life possible. Where's the intelligence coming through them, though, is such a trippy thing. And I don't know that anybody else is writing on this. So you, this next part, you can just chalk up as a little bit of conjecture on some very interesting new science. But the colon is now been recognized to be the most biodiverse ecosystem on the planet, cubic centimeter by cubic centimeter. More diversity than a coral reef or a jungle or whatever you can think of. And as you start to look at colons in their design, you realize the that human there's... Colon, the like human colon, like as in the colon, small and large intestine. This is the large intestine. Yeah, okay. so small intestine and colon. The colon is a very simple looking big tube, but it's got some very strange structures within it, including the appendix, which we always say, oh, that's just not necessary. We'll cut, just cut that thing out. No problem. Like, what could possibly go wrong? Turns out the appendix, though, along with a number of other sections of the colon, 
seem to be very specifically designed to hold more microbiome diversity than any other species before us, including the other mammals. And so the human colon as the most diverse ecosystem is a very interesting observation at kind of the soil systems of life. But some recent studies coming out of California, UCLA, UCSD, both doing some of these uh, studies, Stanford also did some, and these three schools were doing micro imaging of the living intestinal lining. So it was basically looking at the three-dimensional structure rela relationships between the nerves that, that are in the gut lining, the enteric endocrine cells that produce the vast majority of serotonin and dopamine in your body, and then the epithelial barrier system that's responsible for moving water and nutrients into the body. So you had these three cell populations that they were studying and imaging in, you know, live three-dimensional structures for the first time. And what they found that was totally mind-blowing is that the afferent nerves that are very abundant in this two tennis courts of surface area that is your whole gut. Afferent nerves. Afferent, which are the ones that listen. Efferent nerves send signal out. Afferent nerves take information in. And so all of these nerves that are taking information in are poking through the intestinal lining out into the milieu of the bacteria of your gut. This is brand new information. This is like almost too much to handle because we really believe that the brain was the holy of holies and it, you have to be so sterile to have a nerve survive life that it has to be wrapped in all of these levels of protection, the blood brain barrier and all the vascular barrier and all these things that protect our nervous system. So to find out that the nerves were poking out past our, our, our barrier system out into the mess of the bacteria is just seems ridiculous. But as to why, they're, the, again, these are afferent nerves listening to the bacteria. And bringing information to the brain. And what passes through the colon is, is feces, supposedly waste, which is made of 90% bacteria really again, isn't it? Yeah, again, this is the most diverse ecosystem in your, not just your body, but all of nature. So more species of bacteria and fungi in the human colon than anywhere else. And you have all these afferent nerves that are listening out to this mess. And then this is the conjecture part, but think for a moment. What, what a does conjecture mean? Theory. Hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, this is a it's theory. A nice word. But it's an interesting situation where my brain is simply a central processing unit. There's no no actual de novo space in my brain that has an idea. There's no idea manufacturing in my brain. Instead, there's there's only organization of incoming data. And then I put out information based on the organization of the information coming in. And so in this way, it's a central processing unit, the same as your, your CPU chip and your computer. And that CPU chip gets faster and faster, you know, the Intel processor in your computer gets smaller and smaller and faster and faster, doubles its speed every two years More because of innovation, all, of all this stuff. So, but that CPU chip, no matter how fast in its ability to take in information and reorganize it and put it back out, it, it's never thought of anything. It just sits there until information is delivered to it. And so it's never written a term paper. The keyboard has to input a whole bunch of information to that thing before there's anything to even work with. But the keyboard has never written a damn term paper either. It just sits there on the desk until some fingers come and put in some information on that. So if my central processing unit's not writing the thing and my keyboard, which is all my afferent nerves in my body, is not writing the, the idea, who's writing the idea of my human the microbes? Bacteria? The microbes. So the, the bacteria and fungi, i.e. the biodiversity of the planet, as it gets more and more access to a single nervous system, intelligence gets goes higher. So the more species that have access to a single nervous system expresses a higher and higher level of intelligence. And we see this in farms happening. When you get enough species going in a small area, something called quorum sensing can occur. It happens in something as simple as a bacterial you know, petri dish get enough diversity within that thing the the environment starts to do a hyper intelligent phenomenon that we call quorum sensing where they almost function together as one is that there's a, a higher intelligence that emerges and in that situation of a farm field for example the neural network that all of nature has access to is called the mycelial network it's a fiber optic cable system that we call mushrooms and fungi but that's the nervous system that's interacting to create an intelligence on the planet or in a farm field my body is the most diverse farm field ever developed. And so my brain has access to more species than any other brain ever has because of the shape of the human colon. 
And I believe that what, the reason I am more intelligent than a flea or a fruit fly, certainly not the number of genes, it's because I am not human. I am a human vessel that holds an ecosystem. I am an ecosystem more diverse than any other before. And for that, I have a higher level of intelligence than any creature is ever exposed to because I have more access to nature and nature has more access to me and my single nervous system. And my creativity goes up. And I think of new companies every day that I'm out on in nature, swimming in waterfalls last week in Costa Rica, swimming in the ice cold ocean with you guys this morning. The more I do that, the more I can see a different future, the more I can see new ideas for products or companies or whatever it is. And I get, I, it's overwhelming at this point in my life. And my staff kind of goes crazy with it because I have a new idea every 22 seconds. And it's, it's not helpful to somebody who's trying to operationalize a company of like, and so I can only go home on rare occasions and talk to my staff about all my new ideas because they're trying to operationalize everything that I put in motion years ago. And so that can be very difficult for you to figure out the human dimensions around creativity. But I believe it is our future is that as we realize that human ingenuity and creativity is a direct relationship to the amount of nature we are touching, we will start to design our schools much differently. I got to watch my kids homeschool and we raised them in the countryside of Virginia in the woods mostly. And their brilliant mother had them doing something that she just called nature journal every day. And this was the only real homeschooling that they did other than the once a week homeschool co-op they went to, they would do nature journal and they were required to go out every day regardless of the weather and draw something from nature and then make some notes about what they were thinking about that thing. And we still have these incredible journals from both my kids they graduated very early because they kept testing out ahead of age with their, their, the state testing. And so by the time they were 14, they had graduated uh, from high school and testing out of that and were in community college. And then by the time they were 9 or 10, they started telling us what they thought they were going to do with the rest of their life. They had found their creative purpose kind of thing. And so my son wanted to be an engineer. My daughter wanted to be in performing arts. And they went on to do that. And now they're adults and living these amazing lives. And they're just decades ahead of where I was or where their peers seem to be. And I really increasingly believe it's because they spent so much time in nature that they were tied into the intelligence of a natural system that was going to express itself through a single neurologic system that we would call Alyssa or Ethan. And, and these beings are now more complete for the amount of nature they touched and the amount that nature thought and created through them. And so the, uh, this is where we will build schools in the future is outdoors and they will be purely experiential rather than abstract learning environments where we will have them building tree houses or, you know, interacting with little river systems and building you know, devices inside the water to capture energy from the water flow. Like Ewoks. Or, yeah, kind of like Ewoks, Ewoks. Ewok villages. That's a great image. I'm going to hold that one. I love that. That's, I like that's just great. remember it was like <laughs> building trees and it just, I remember we used to imagine being Ewoks when we were kids. And if anyone doesn't get this reference, it was like grown up in the 80s and the 90s, Star, Star Wars, Wars. And it was the Ewok villages. And they were like, they were living at one with nature with these super cool tree houses. And, and they were damn cute. Yeah, they yeah. Okay. Cute David, buggers. you're allowing the tone of the conversation. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm aware of so it. intelligent and I brought in the Ewoks. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it made us laugh. <laughs> but look really, how smart the Ewoks were. You know, they were like these little fuzzy creatures, not bigger than a teddy bear, and yet they, the force was strong in them. You know, yeah. yeah and yeah, so yeah. that is what we want our children to to become strong in the force. And what is the force? The force is a continuous flow of energy through what we call life, which is a concentration of energy that separates us from physics. And so we are not stars anymore. We have something, we're actually burning brighter than the stars we come from. The stardust has been concentrated in our bodies to become something that's so animated with, with that solar energy of, of suns near and distant. We are burning so bright as a species right now. And there's 8 billion of us on the planet right now. 8 billion suns burning 10,000 times brighter than the sun. And so I get so interested in what other bandwidths of detection might be seeing in the universe when they look out in space and there's a little speck out there that we call earth how bright might that speck look to beings that are out in the universe and so the idea of extraterrestrial life makes a lot of sense to me because we must be so visible to a different spectrum of monitoring 
instead of looking at light energy in the in the radiation form of a sun, if they look at light energy in the form of biology, we must be a huge beacon out in the dark, you know, darkness of space. We must be very visible because we have got eight billion of these, you know, human suns here and elephants on top of that and the lions and the beaver and the alligator and everybody else out here. And so we've got so much biology on this planet that's expressing light energy that we must be very visible for a very long time to the cosmos and anything that would be intelligent within that cosmos. And so uh, I think we're a lighthouse in the middle of a very huge black space. And this lighthouse is one that's thriving with life. And we're being called to see if we can do a, an orbital shift. Can we actually get brighter? And I believe that that's possible now. Now that we understand the dance of carbon and water and the play of mitochondria inside of human cells and their relationship to the to the green plants that we grow in the fields and their relationship to the soil system. And as we start to really understand the full organism of the earth, not only could we regreen Africa, which would be good for the planet and climate change suddenly becomes, or climate crisis suddenly becomes climate opportunity. But to what end? Like, why bother? Like, so that we can build bigger empires and extract more later or whatever it is. And so I think that's the important question that we must do. And this is kind of your point of like, new phones, so new homes. No, I didn't. We should definitely get the iPhone 42. <laughs> no question. Good one. So the opportunity that we have is, is massive, but to what end? And for that, I think it's to burn brighter, which means can we figure out lifestyles and engineering and human ingenuity that would maximize our, our colon's biodiversity so that the average American is no longer walking around with 10,000, and, and, but we get back towards maybe that optimal of 40 to 100,000 species of, of bacteria, let alone maybe another million species of fungi that are thriving within our organ systems. And they are all starting to think new thoughts through our neurologic system that's in direct contact through our gut to those bacterium. And so we start to therefore support a mitochondrial thrive state that we've maybe never seen in humans before as we understand those cycles. And if we get more mitochondria per cell, imagine human beings that could hold 20% more mitochondria. Suddenly there's not 200, but 220. 240 or 300 mitochondria per human cell. And suddenly the solar energy that we can release in a body is 20%, 50% more. The speed at which we regenerate would do something that we've never seen human biology do. Our lifespans could completely radically change. The amount of neurologic information that we could process in a given split second could radically transform. And so much like we're anticipating the arrival of the quantum computer chip, where we're no longer relying on, you know, little switches in, on these little circuit boards, but we're actually using atoms as the switchers in a quantum computer. Our, every cell in our body is a quantum computer. It's all running off of atomic switching instead of something else. This is how proteins figure out how to come from new genes, how viruses code for new species. It, it's all down at the atomic level. And so our computer industry is about to catch up with biology. It's about to create a very dumbed down version of a single human cell with the first quantum chip. And everybody's like, oh my God, that, that apparently, I mean, the numbers are pretty amazing. The, the quantum chip that IBM has right now, as it doubles its speed one more time in the next 18 months or so, we're expecting that one chip to be able to make the same number of calculations in one minute that all of the computers on earth can currently do in a thousand years. One chip. Wow. And so we're about to go through this literal quantum leap in speed of computing. And yet that is a distant, you know, dumbed down version of the intelligence that you have in a single cell. So we are struggling towards our opportunity or our ability to understand just how brilliant life is. And I think as soon as we really come to terms with that, you know, this whole AI system is almost hilarious. Like, you know, there's all this concern that maybe computers could start to write term papers just as good as our high school students, as if term papers were the greatest expression of humanity. Show me the AI system that, that knows how to create the, the sensation of love in another being, like your words can to your lover, and then maybe I'll be impressed. You know, mm. Maybe that comes, and maybe that's beautiful, because if everybody's feeling more love from their their AI partner, maybe that's a good thing. I can't even put a good, bad thing on that. As long as there's more love in the universe, we're doing a good thing. Is it really artificial intelligence? It's gotta be intelligence. We've created it, we are nature, nothing separate from nature. Is it really artificial or is it just 
our technology catch, catching up to the expression Jeez, of you're biology. You're breaking paradigms today. <laughs> you're knocking down walls. <laughs> <laughs> and so ultimately intelligence is intelligence. And if we've created it, it's not separate from nature. You know, the Oxford English Dictionary, I believe, is wrong. If we've created it, it is of nature and we are nature. And so all we're doing is bringing our technology in line with biologic intelligence and biologic capacity or the intelligence of life itself. And that doesn't worry me because life itself affirms more biodiversity at every term it makes. And so AI systems that, that are bad for us are going to be so short-lived. Maybe they can cause us extinction for a moment and then life is going to go on so much more beautiful on the other side. Or maybe there's some AI systems that support this explosion. So this is where my little software company is imagining is what would the internet look like empowered by an AI system that actually supports human ingenuity rather than replaces it. And so there's opportunities for us to use technology in biomimicry patterns that it gets me really excited. It's like there's no reason to be judgmental towards technology. There's only an opportunity to look past the judgment and get to this curiosity moment of how would nature do it if she designed a software platform? How would nature do it if she designed the internet? Oh, she already did the mycelial network. How does the mycelial network work? How would we mimic that in our software technologies or our IT systems of the future? In the end, I think we're going to find out that they're going to look a lot like being out in the backyard and our children will, again, be raised out there and will be reconnected. And the quantum computers that sit on our desk will be a, a vague memory because we realize that we can compute and exchange information through the mycelial network be beneath our feet as long as we take our shoes off. And so we're going to get we're going to get there one way or the other. Either through, we're going to go forward to go back. Either we'll go backwards and fall back into some Neanderthal status, or we'll leap forward into some Neanderthal status. <laughs> Zach Whoa. Bush, you are phenomenal. The journey I feel I've been taking on here today. <laughs> awesome. You've put me in a state of awe many times <laughs> this afternoon. So Thank glad you. glad to be with you guys. It Thanks really, for sharing your environment with me. It's been such a blessing to meet your families and your community at large, your ocean, your your pebbled beaches. It's spectacular. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the hit gym this afternoon. That was a fun experience. So That's we'll be sweating together. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's you. great well, Zach thanks, Bush, you're amazing yeah. my mind is blown yet again <laughs> thank you thank you thank you I appreciate you guys having the opportunity to be together it's lovely